tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The devil doesn't come dressed in a red cape and pointy horns. He comes as everything you've ever wished for. Tucker Max. Chapter 1. The Penthouse. Thomas stared out over New York from the 34th floor of Manhattan Dynamics Corporate Center, amused at how he could look down on the world. It had taken a lot of hard work to become the youngest CEO in the company's history. Sipping his wonderfully aged scotch, he stood before the full-length windows and admired the city at night, feeling as though a king must feel when he stares down from his tower over his kingdom. Good night, Mr. Burkhoff, Jillian said as she finished buttoning her shirt and fluffing her silky blonde hair before exiting the office. Thomas gave a slight nod of acknowledgement. Entering the private bathroom in his office to get a shower before heading home, he wondered how his son, Thomas II, was doing. Home life had become boring to him. He carried on with the farce of his marriage to maintain the other half of his assets. Besides, she was probably getting her own side action anyways. Thomas would spend two or three days at the office before coming home for a day. The penthouse suite they resided in was well decorated and furnished. The walls contained more art than family memories. Thomas Sr. was far more interested in grooming a future CEO than being a caring father. Thomas II had learned the benefits of charisma and ruthlessness from his father. High school had been his training ground to hone his skills for the business world after college. When Thomas Sr. would come home, the conversation focused more on lessons of self-advancement at all costs than real bonding time with his son. Thomas was proud of what his son was becoming. The conversations they had when he was home made his time away from the office bearable, if not almost worth it. Success demands sacrifice, he had once told his son. The acceptance letters from Ivy League colleges should be arriving in the mail soon. Thomas expected nothing less. After the shower, Thomas dressed in a handsome Giorgio Armani suit, impeccably pressed white turnbull and asser collared shirt, the Cole Hahn wingtips in a beautiful burnt honey color. Thomas rarely existed outside of a well-tailored suit. His suits were his armor, and in them, he felt invincible. Thomas polished off the last of his scotch and approached the elevator, illuminating the down button with a touch. As he stood waiting, he scrolled through tomorrow's calendar, meeting at 10 a.m. with the board, meeting with the lawyers about a lawsuit pertaining to a company they purchased at 11 a.m. On and on and on. A soft ding caused Thomas to slide his phone into the inner breast pocket of his suit, the stainless steel double doors parted to allow him entrance. The cool glow of the fluorescent bulbs flickered for a mere instant, and then steadied. Thomas entered the elevator and pressed the button for the first floor. The elevator began its smooth descent until a light squeal caught Thomas's ear. The sound became more pronounced and took on a grinding tone. Thomas scanned the ceiling of the aluminum tomb. The elevator started to vibrate and jerk. The sudden realization that he was suspended 29 floors above the ground in a box sent his heart into a quick jog. There are emergency brakes and backups, he thought. I'll be fine. Just perhaps stuck for an hour or two. The elevator made a large jolt as it free fell momentarily, then jerked to a stop. Thomas's heart was in a full-blown sprint now, hands wrapped so tightly around the railings it made them ache. Struggling to regain control of his breath and his wandering mind, Thomas slowly moved from the far corner towards the emergency button near the doors. The elevator moaned and creaked under the shifting weight of each slow step. As he reached the middle, the tracks moaned louder, and Thomas paused. His breath more controlled now, but his jugular was proof that his heart wasn't slowing down for anything. A calmness and silence took hold of everything. 
Thomas seized this moment and took one more step and pressed the emergency button with a slight panic. For a second, nothing happened. Suddenly, the alarm screamed, blocking out all other sounds. After what seemed like an eternity of the electronic howling, a voice crackled to the speaker on the wall. Elevator 1, are you in trouble? What seems to be the emergency? A light feminine voice metallically tweaked through the speaker. Hello, this is Thomas Burkhoff and I'm stuck in here. Cracking a nervous smile, he was relieved that he had reached someone. Sir, it's going to be... The voice over the speaker began to crack and fade. No! Wait! You're breaking up! Thomas said in a higher voice than he knew he had. A piercing sound like amplifier feedback shot out of the speaker. Don't worry, Thomas. I have everything well in hand, came a deep, gravelly voice. I'll do my best to keep you comfortable down here. The voice sneered with a hollow, sinister laugh that echoed from everywhere. Thomas's eyes shot around, looking for the source of the laughter. His stomach jumped into his throat before he could comprehend what happened. The sound of the metallic cable snapping pierced the silence like a gunshot. Thomas's heart seized, and the elevator plummeted into the dark. Chapter 2 Circle of Fire Thomas awoke not to the sight of crumpled metal, electric sparks, or even pain. There was just nothingness. A blackness that seemed to have darker shades of black the harder he tried to look into it. Welcome, Thomas. A strong rasping voice came from directly behind him. Spinning quickly, he found a mirror image of himself. A striking man of 45. Strong jawline with olive skin and freshly shaven face. Icy blue eyes that would rival the clearest blue sky. Dark brown hair that bordered on black. Impeccably maintained. Undressed to exude power. Who are you? I know you're not me! Thomas croaked. Oh, but I am. <laughs> oh, I am you. The dark in you. There is so much dark in you, too. Buttoning his suit jacket, trying to regain the calm, cool control that allowed him to thrive and close massive deals, Thomas breathed deeply. I asked you a question. Who are you? he said, the confidence returning to his voice. Oh, over the millennia, I've been given so many names. Um, Lucifer? The Devil? Ugh, Satan. Beelzebub? Shall I keep going? The Devil? Really? Thomas's voice oozed condescension. Well, that's quite okay. You don't need to believe. We're here to discuss you anyways, Lucifer said, buttoning his coat as well. Shall we get on with it then? Let's get this over with. I'm a very busy man. Instantly, the footing beneath Thomas dissolved. As he plummeted down, the acrid smell of rotten eggs filled his nostrils. The darkness began to illuminate with a faint glow. Then, all at once... They were standing on a rocky cliff, surrounded by flames, leaping fifty stories in the air. Waves of wailing bombarded him, the sound of agony continually crashing against his eardrums. The heat in the air was stifling and burned with every inhalation. Thomas looked back at the mirror image of himself and saw the glossy blackness spread across Lucifer's eyes. Welcome again to my... Ugh. <sighs> I'm sorry. Our home, Lucifer stated with a sneer. I... I don't belong down here with you, you... You monster! Thomas lashed out. No, of course you don't belong here. This is only the first level of hell. You belong much further below. This place is reserved for those with uh, petty crimes. The entry level to hell, one might say. Lucifer's gravelly voice began to take on a metallic tinge. I have much more planned for you. 
Why the fuck do I belong down here? <clears throat> I've given money to charities, helped build orphanages, donated <coughs> food shelters. I'm a <coughs> philanthropist, damn it! Thomas retorted, choking on the heavy air and smoke. Didn't you receive tax credits for each of those acts? You didn't actually give anything that wasn't made back during tax season, and you know it, Lucifer smirked. Of course I did, but that's what makes it a win-win. The destitute get the money they need to help them, and I don't technically lose any money. How is that worth all this? Thomas's eyes opened wide, searching for the answer. <laughs> it's not. Tell me, Thomas. With a number of souls damned to this place, do you think I greet each one personally? The question hung in the air while Thomas thought. Let me help you out. No! I don't. You are a special case, Thomas. And the number of souls you sent me and will be sending me in the future deserves a reward. You've been one of my best agents. Depending on how our meeting goes, I may reward you with a hundred years out of every millennium free of torture during your eternal stay when all is said and done. Lucifer said coolly and plunged his hands into his pant pockets. Two hundred and fifty years seemed like a more appropriate reward if I am in fact that valuable, barked Thomas, ever the businessman. Oh, one hundred and twenty-five years. And I suggest you take that because there will not be an alternative offer. Lucifer's gaze never left Thomas's eyes. Before I agree to any sort of deal, what proof is there that I belong here with the rabble of humanity? A wicked grin fell over Lucifer's face. This is the part I love the most. Shattering the illusions you humans have of your perfect lives. Suddenly, the two were walking on a rocky path in another part of hell amidst a cacophony of agony so thick it was almost tangible. Seeing the torment in one man's eyes, Thomas tried to avert his gaze. Take this monster that once walked the streets of Russia preying on the weak. This here is Andrei Chikatilo. He was known as the Butcher of Rostov. Andrei was a serial killer in Russia preying on women and children. In his relatively short time on Earth, he brought terror, torment, and death to 56 poor souls. He was only convicted of 52. Andre was strapped down to a stone table on his stomach. Thomas's mouth gaped as he witnessed the flesh being filleted from his back in long strips. It was like seeing the skin of an apple removed in a bright red ribbon. Except this apple screamed. Just when the demon ran out of strips of flesh, the table turned red hot, scorching his front. While the front of him burned, the skin on his back grew back almost instantly. Then, the process started all over again. Thomas turned and vomited off the edge of the path into a river of lava ten feet below. Staggering back to his feet and using his pocket square to wipe his mouth, he walked on. Lucifer just smiled and strode forward. Now, where should we begin? Like most children, you had your arguments and schoolyard brawls, but those don't concern me. Hmm... Your dad always expected top marks from you. There was no settling for second best. What's wrong with that? I don't see the harm in a man wanting his child to excel in life and make something of himself. Thomas's voice fell flat as his eyes scanned the surrounding suffering. Seeing the torment in one man's eyes, Thomas tried to avert his gaze. Your dad would lash you with a belt when things weren't done to his satisfaction, correct? Lucifer probed, already knowing the answer. My... my father instilled discipline in me and taught me that actions had consequences. Thomas retorted defensively. Ah, I see. I'm simply educating you in the ways of the world. Lucifer questioned. Of course! My dad was just trying to prepare me. Wait, did I just say dad? What am I, ten years old? 
Thomas did not like feeling like he was losing control. Is this what it's like for people talking to me every day? Lucifer just walked, a smug look painted on his face. Did your dad feel as if your mother hadn't learned that lesson as a child? Thomas knew Lucifer had used dad on purpose to highlight Thomas's insecurity. Thomas had used that very tactic countless times on members of the board he wanted to undermine. Thomas was missing the point of the question, though. Distracted like a child again, focused on the item meant to anger him. What are you talking about? Thomas looked with caution at Lucifer. Thomas heard a scream increasing in volume until it felt like the audible anguish was going to plow into him. Instead, there was a huge splat that hit the lava river beside them. The two looked up and saw the forms of men and women falling from the sky in balls of blue-orange fire, each comet producing its own resonance of suffering. The combined measure created a harmony of horror. Some careened into the sides of mountains, some into more lava lakes, and some into other souls, already in the middle of torture, like Andre. I call these little soul storms unfortunate showers, sneered Lucifer. At first Thomas missed the pun, and then it hit him. Unfortunate being a synonym for damned. He knew the devil wasn't supposed to be nice, but man, what an asshole. All around them ethereal bodies blew apart in high-speed collisions. There were parts of arms, legs, intestines... Thomas saw more than one eyeball separated from its socket, frantically looking around as it lay on the ground. Thomas had never experienced the kind of fracturing that was now taking place in his mind. Her mother wore a lot of modest clothes, right? High necklines, long sleeves, pants, or long skirts. Dresses that were full length with long sleeve cover-ups? Lucifer inquired in a leading manner. What does my mom... I mean, my mother's clothing have to do... Before he could finish the sentence, Thomas realized what Lucifer meant. When his father left a mark on him that could be visible to someone at school, Thomas had to wear clothes that would conceal it. A lead brick dropped into his stomach. D my dad hit my mom. Seeing the surprise in his face, Lucifer couldn't contain his fang-toothed grin. That's... That's bullshit! exclaimed Thomas. But he knew that wasn't true. His father had been an abusive husband, his mother a battered wife, and Thomas could never deny it again. Did you know they're both down here? Lucifer probed. I understand why my father would be, but... Why the fuck would my mom be down here? He had removed the personal title of dad, but doubled down on the swell of emotions by saying, Mom. That quickly, Thomas thought. Just like that, I can emotionally alienate my father. Screw it, the bastard deserves it, was his next thought. Lucifer's gaze hung on Thomas as he leaned against an obsidian pillar. The pillar was carved in the form of a cowardly-looking man, being crushed while holding up a large bowl that contained a naked woman with sheer ecstasy in her features. Men being crushed by lust or desires. Your mom killed your father in an act of premeditated and cold-blooded murder. For that act, she's been sent here. My mother isn't some criminal mastermind. How could she have killed my father and gotten away with it? Sucks, Lucifer replied, his smile gleaming. But I, I know it sucks, but tell me, damn it! Thomas roared. You misunderstand me. Sucks. It's a paralytic medication usually used to relax tense muscles during surgery. The full name is succinylcholine, or sucks, for short. The beauty of sucks as a murder weapon is it leaves barely any trace in a toxicology report. A clinical dose would have killed your father in five to ten minutes but it could have just left him brain dead. Your mom made sure it went past the clinical dosage. The explanation from Lucifer bore almost no inflection. It was like he was describing people walking across the street in Manhattan. 
Wouldn't the drug make it look like my father overdosed? Thomas questioned. That would raise suspicion since my father didn't have any other drugs around the house. True. You would think socks produces some telltale sign. But it doesn't. Your father spent the last moments of his life looking up at the woman he had beaten into submission. Paralyzed. He felt the chilling sensation of losing the use of his fingers. Then arms. Then legs. Then head and neck. Slowly, he felt the paralytic start to seize control of his lungs. Straining with every bit of his mind to draw breath in and out knowing that it wasn't working. Looking at the needle in your mother's hand and laboring with all the force he could muster to scream out, yet not making so much as a peep. Your father drowned in a room full of air. Lucifer paused to allow his words to sink in. How did she get it? Thomas squeaked out. A pharmacy tech that was a battered woman as well. The tech noticed a bruise on your mother's back when she dropped her driver's license on the floor. Her shirt pulled up and exposed the bruise for a split second. The tech took her to a small exam room next to the pharmacy and was able to finally coax it out of her. She grabbed the vial out of a box that had been delivered. much she would need to use to get the job done, and to make sure she discarded it well, and then left the room. A confident look rested on Lucifer's face as he concluded the tale. Tears streamed down Thomas's cheeks but evaporated before they even hit the ground. I never knew my mother had been abused. Lips and voice quivering as he spoke, a deep red rage filled Thomas suddenly. Why in the fuck do you have her down here to spend an eternity being tormented when her life is already full of torment? Hey, don't blame me, he shrugged nonchalantly. Blame the ever-merciful God you mortals love to pin your hopes on. She broke his rule, and despite the good reason she had to erase your father from the planet, he punished her for it. Thomas could feel the rage building behind his eyes. He grabbed Lucifer by the suit and was already in motion to punch him when Lucifer's eyes became pits of smoldering pitch black fire. How dare you! The voice resounded from every direction in an inhuman tone. Thomas crumbled to the floor, instantly remembering who was in front of him and just where he was again. The crackling flaming eye sockets cooled and returned to the glossy pitch black orbs they had been. Huh. Now where were we? Lucifer said merrily as if the whole thing hadn't happened. Slowly, Thomas returned to his feet and dusted himself off. My parents, said Thomas, voice trembling. Ah, yes. Enough about them, though. You know their fate. But what about your life's deeds that have earned you your place down here? I think it's time for a change of scenery before we start on your life, though. Lucifer snapped his finger, and with a brilliant and violent flash, they were gone. Chapter 3 Circle of Gluttony Thomas heard the growls, so much yelling that he was terrified to open his eyes. Slowly, one eye cracked to let in a sliver of his surroundings. Lucifer and Thomas were standing in a stone cliff, and was perched about thirty feet above a vast dirt and rock plain. At regular intervals stood mountains of food inside cages. Crowns were gathered around every possible inch of the ground, reaching through the iron bars for any scrap of food they could grab. The food sat mere inches out of reach. From beneath the cliff, Thomas heard what sounded like large doors creaking their way open. From out of the doors came thousands, no, millions of small babies. Something appeared off, though. Thomas opened his eyes fully and saw the babies had small horns protruding from their heads and tails of varying shades from bright red to the darkest crimson. 
These babies were demon children. The huddled masses were so fixated on the food that they didn't notice the flurry of activity behind them until teeth started sinking into their flesh. A torrent of screams rose up in the vast cavern and moved across the plain in a wave as the demon spawns reached the souls farther away. Looking out over the waves of carnage, a cold sweat formed on Thomas's head. His legs turned into wet noodles instead of bones and muscles. The gnashing of teeth and wailing had to stop. Welcome to gluttony, Lucifer said with a flourish. Why the souls of those who gorged themselves in life become the very thing they pursued with such passion and conviction in death. Food. The gluttonous feed the young demons of hell. Help them grow big and strong so that one day I can send them above. Lucifer stood surveying the carnage and beamed proudly. This is disgusting, Thomas said, fighting a rising urge to vomit. Turning his back on the demonic banquet, Thomas steeled his nerves. Why are we here, Lucifer? Because you are glutton, Tom. You don't mind if I call you Tom, right? How am I a glutton? Thomas asked, chuckling and looking at his toned body. Mm, true, you're not a glutton of food. You are, however, a glutton of power and sadness. You enjoy imposing your will upon people and feasting on their sadness when they leave dissatisfied. Let's talk about your childhood and your brother, Lucifer said as he paced to the edge of the cliff, looking down. No, don't go there. Lucifer! Day after day, you would convince your little brother to do what you wanted to do. He would play the games you wanted to play, play by the rules you set. Say, what kind of fun things were there to do in the Steel City? Lucifer, don't. Don't what? Lucifer cut Thomas off. What do you think you're here for, Thomas? A stroll down happy memory lane? Or look at all the positive things you've done with your life? You're in hell. For a CEO, you're a pretty slow learner. The low flames building in Lucifer's eyes begin to cool again. Now, as I was saying, you grew up in Pittsburgh. And when kids get bored, they tend to do dumb things. Don't worry. That's not just a Pittsburgh thing, that's an everywhere thing. Lucifer chuckled. So, do you remember the morning of Johnny's 10th birthday? You told him, as a rite of passage, he had to sneak onto a train and off without being caught? Thomas covered his ears and paced back and forth, muttering curses, trying to drown out Lucifer's voice. Do you really think covering your ears will help you? I can talk straight into your mind in this place, Thomas. Your brother did exactly what you asked of him. He snuck aboard an empty train. You and your friends stood a couple of tracks away, mocking him for choosing an empty train. As he got to the ladder to get down, the engineer came out of nowhere. Thomas pinched his eyes closed, but the memory played back on the back of his eyelids like a movie screen. Hey, get back here, you hoodlum! The engineer barked. The engineer reached for Johnny's hand to pull him back up. In a panic, Johnny let go of the ladder and pushed himself away from the train. Minutes seemed to pass as he fell. Johnny came crashing down and cracked the back of his head in the steel rail of the track. Your friends ran towards him and you ran away. Like a coward. Thomas wept on his knees. I was running to get my parents. Thomas choked out between sobs. Bullshit. You and I both know that's complete and utter bullshit. <laughs> You ran and hid behind an abandoned building. Not at the loss of your brother, but because you told him to do something, and he did it. You had the power to convince someone to do something and they obeyed you. Yeah, you eventually got to your feet and had someone call 911. 
You were grounded for a month and spanked with a belt, but the rush you felt had never left you. Now you just assume people have no choice but to listen to you. Thomas sprang up from the ground and closed the distance between them with speed unknown to him. Anger, rage, and guilt drove him forward. With one tremendous push, Thomas freed Lucifer from his spot on the cliff and sent him falling into the valley of teeth and blood. Lucifer screamed as he fell and hit the ground in a cloud of dust. Thomas looked for signs of Lucifer's body but saw nothing. With a crack of thunder, Lucifer appeared behind Thomas. Whirling around to defend himself, Thomas reached to grab Lucifer by the jacket, but Lucifer already had a hand around Thomas's throat. Thick, gnarled nails extended from Lucifer's now crimson-red hand. Thomas got a small glimpse of what Lucifer's real form looked like in the demonic hand. Thomas, I am trying, but you are really testing my patience. Lucifer said as he walked Thomas to the edge of the cliff. Lucifer stood at the edge as Thomas's foam body weight hung from Lucifer's clutch. He clawed at Lucifer's arm and whimpered for his life. Lucifer's face contorted, sprouting two large curved horns, his eyes pits of black fire in strong chiseled features. I could cast you down and let the younglings devour you, find new and creative ways to torment your soul. That's not why I brought you here, though. Lucifer stepped off the cliff, lowering them both down to the floor below. As punishment for your actions, you will have three bites taken from you. Thomas fought to free himself. Lucifer's clutch in his throat was unwavering. Picking three demonic toddlers at random, Lucifer called them over. Now each of you gets one bite. That's it. Lucifer informed them in a fatherly tone. The first satanic spawn bit down on Thomas's forearm, taking clothing and flesh without discrimination. Thomas shrieked as muscle was ripped from bone. Blood oozed from every severed blood vessel in the bite. Thomas strained to keep his mind from shredding with the pain. The second vile-looking gremlin had blood dripping from its mouth with scratches all over from fighting over the souls they had torn apart. The gremlin sprung to his arm like a perch and bit into the side of his neck, shaking his head as he ripped a crescent of flesh from Thomas and leapt back to the ground, chewing. The hellion had missed his jugular on purpose. Lightning shot through his body with the second bite, and Thomas felt as though he was going to pass out. Lucifer slapped his face firmly to keep Thomas awake. The last one barely waited for the second wicked creature to clear before it leapt to the right calf muscle. Stretching its jaw as wide as possible, half of Thomas's calf had now been volunteered as a snack. With so much pain already bombarding his body, Thomas's brain barely registered the bite. His body fell limp in Lucifer's hand and crumpled to the floor as his throat was freed from the demonic grip. Everything went black. Chapter 4 Circle of Treachery Thomas slowly awoke to his body's uncontrolled shivering and snow crystals stinging his face. He quickly glanced down at his arm and calf while simultaneously reaching for his neck. The wounds were gone, but a sharp tinge of pain remained in each spot. Had Lucifer tired of him and left him to freeze to death? Thomas scoffed at that thought. How can you die again if you're already dead? Flashes of the tortures he had seen and felt here proved you could. Over and over again, you could and would die forever. Thomas heard something like the hiss of water hitting a scalding hot pan only to see the devil standing behind him. Feeling better after our beauty rest, are we, Thomas? Whipping his head around, Thomas saw Lucifer standing there with all the snow in a five-foot radius melted around him. Despite the fear he felt, Thomas rushed over to gain some warmth from Lucifer. Where are we? Why is it so cold here? Thomas asked through chattering teeth. This? Hmm. This is the circle of treachery, and it is the very lowest level of hell. Lucifer said with a grim look. 
What's the matter, Lucifer? You don't seem to delight in this circle as much as the others, Thomas said with a smirk. Watch it. I can go back to letting you freeze if you prefer. Thomas just shook his head, casting his eyes downward. I despise this circle because it is the circle I am condemned to by my creator. I disagreed with his opinion, which started a fight. Then a war, Lucifer said as he began to walk up a snow-covered ridge. Thomas snuck close to Lucifer, trying to keep his soul from freezing. That doesn't explain the cold, though, Lucifer. Thomas threw the verbal jab out. Lucifer clenched his teeth, so the punch landed. This place is a frozen wasteland for two reasons. First, it keeps my physical form sealed in ice. The second is because the souls that come here betray people without any caring or warmth in their hearts. They actually make this place colder. The snow liquefied and evaporated in front of Lucifer with each step he took. Meanwhile, the wind howled around them. Snow blew across the vast expanse with strange-looking trees dotting the landscape. Thomas couldn't make out why they looked strange, only that he had never seen them before. As they were approaching the crest of the ridge, Thomas could hear voices on the wind. Unable to make them out, either because of the distance or the sheer number of people, Thomas strained to hear any of them individually. As they crested the hill, Thomas saw a mass of humanity all gathered around a perfectly circular chasm. The chasm had a large island in the middle with a roaring fire. Planks stretched horizontally across the chasm. People were at various stages of crossing the planks when the masses would turn the planks on their side and drop those crossing into the pit below. Thomas spotted three people working as a team. Two were fending off several others attempting to reach the makeshift bridge. Just before making it across, the individual transversing the plank was thrown off by his protectors. They lifted the board, causing him to lose his footing and fall into the pit. One of the protectors seized the opportunity to push the other into the pit, but was pulled in by the falling protector. They both fell into the dark and let out horrific screams seconds later. They could all be warm if they worked together to cross, but they're all traitors and turn on each other as soon as they're given the chance, Lucifer said, his calm and confidence both back in place. What's in the bottom of the pit? What's with these weird-looking trees? Thomas questioned warily. The bottom of the pit is filled with thousands and thousands of razor-sharp stalagmites of ice. The trees are twisted monuments of treachery. Groups of people trying to reach the fires from further out on the ice lake. They all try to rob each other of body heat and use each other as shelter from the driving winds. As a result, their bodies were frozen together in unnatural patterns which, oddly enough, emulate nature. Lucifer gave a chuckle and a shrug as he said it, hands sunk in his pants pockets. Why are we down in this circle, Lucifer? Lucifer turned to Thomas, head cocked to the side like a dog. <laughs> Surely you're joking, right? <laughs> what about the numerous women you betrayed by claiming they were the only one, or the wife you haven't been faithful to in years? Defensively, Thomas lashed back. Hey! I am 100% sure my wife is cheating on me as well. Plus, all the other girls were just during dating. I only told them the things they wanted to hear to keep them around until I was done with them. They weren't serious about me like I wasn't about them. Those relationships with that of a, a couple of teenagers having fun. Thomas laughed it off. <laughs> Everyone does that when they're young. Lucifer's mouth twisted into a knowing smirk. Three of your ex-girlfriends were so in love with you that they committed suicide after you dumped them. Does that sound like kids that weren't serious? Or having fun? It was a punch that knocked the breath out of Thomas. Lucifer let the aching silence stretch on for a minute. 
That's three souls you have placed in my care. However, that's not all. Thomas's eyes flashed at Lucifer, half angered and half terrified to hear more. You look at me as if you haven't lived the life yourself. You've seen the movie. You already know what's coming. With a blinding light and the smell of sulfur that accompanies a match being lit, they were transported again. They stood before a man whose feet were frozen in place and had just had a searing hot bucket of water poured over them. Any ice that clung to his skin was promptly melted and flesh almost glowed red from the burns. Six demons began pummeling him, each wielding a different weapon fashioned from ice. A sledgehammer, a mace, a whip, a scythe, a chain, and a samurai sword, each leaving their own unique mark of pain on his flesh. What in the hell are we looking at? Thomas groaned, feeling queasy. Oh, you mean who, don't you? Lucifer cocked an eyebrow up. Thomas turned and gave a look of, are you serious? This is H.H. H. Holmes. He created a murder mystery mansion in Chicago, Illinois during the time of the World's Fair. He lured helpless, innocent women with the promise of employment during the event. They were each tormented or tortured in varying rooms of the house and were eventually murdered. Betraying the trust of others for his own devious pleasures landed him in this place. Now he is made to feel the cold sting of betrayers' commonly used tools. Lucifer gestured with a sweeping palm up motion. I fail to see how those weapons are tools of deceit, Thomas scoffed. The sledgehammer is a blunt but powerful betrayal. The mace represents a heavy betrayal that was barbed with the intent to inflict pain. The whip and chain are both meant to cause more acute betrayals, but the chain is one that lies are built link upon link. The sword represents betrayals that are meant to take pieces of you or kill the light inside you. Finally, the scythe is meant to sever you from your connection with people, places, or things. Lucifer grinned widely at the beauty of it. Thomas nodded as the man slowly refroze to start the process again. He could see how each was meant to inflict a certain kind of pain. Let's talk about your business partner, Andy Schultz. Thomas gave Lucifer a solemn look and began a well-rehearsed speech. It was a terrible tragedy. We had warned him about drinking on the roof and that he could fall. His, his poor parents and fiancé, the, the loss they must have felt. Unbearable. Thomas bowed his head. A slow clap began. Bravo. Just incredible. You know, that almost looked and sounded sincere. Seriously, Thomas, you are a professional. Thomas looked up, deflated. Now, let's discuss what really happened. You met Andy Schultz in an intro to business class in your first year at Stanford. You thought he was a bit quirky, but you guys became fast friends. The two of you swore that you would help each other to not only pass, but that you would be valedictorian and salutatorian. Incredibly, you were, for your associates bachelor's and master's degrees. You both applied to Manhattan Dynamics and took upper mid-level positions as a reward for your hard work. If all this wasn't impressive enough, you both buckled down even harder and put in some grueling nights. Thirty-six hour shifts. I gotta tell you, Thomas, if you had focused your efforts toward cancer research or some ugh, noble cause, you could have done some real good in the world. Not that it makes a difference now. Thomas looked irked and over it. Can we just skip to the end, Lucifer? Oh, no, we can't do that. The best part is just around the corner. Pure joy painted across Lucifer's face. Your teamwork rewarded you guys yet again by moving up the ranks very quickly. You managed to do it the fastest in the company history, as a matter of fact. 
The problem was Andy was starting to drift a little. You noticed he didn't want to stay late into the night as often, coming up with excuses for why he needed to leave. Doing your research, you found out he met a girl and was quite smitten. Andy's work began to slack, and you were picking up more of his responsibilities to help. He became jealous of his relationship and his beautiful girlfriend. You became jealous that he had a life outside of work. You, your goals, your priorities were no longer at the top of his priority list. After a couple of years of hard work, you finally made it onto the board of directors. Do you remember who wasn't there to congratulate you? Lucifer probed, inquiring. Of course I remember, Thomas hissed. Andy. Lucifer nodded. Do you remember what was so important that he wasn't there for you on your big day? Thomas shot Lucifer a glare. The asshole was getting engaged. <sighs> Can you believe it? After all of our hard work to make it to the top, he was willing to throw it away for a woman! Lucifer grinned from ear to ear. This next part is my favorite. The beauty behind it just fills me with joy. You called him in a calm voice, told him about your promotion, and said he should come up to your new office on the 33rd floor for a mandatory celebration drink. He came straight to your office, embraced you, and sincerely congratulated you. And he excitedly revealed the reason for his absence the day before and that it was cause for celebration as well, forcing a smile and feigning happiness for Andy. You led him to the rooftop. Finally, after getting him good and drunk, Andy stood at the edge of the rooftop looking out over the city. You shoved your best friend from the rooftop, watched him fall to the concrete waiting below before removing your prints from the glass and bottle of liquor and setting them on the ledge. You're damn right I did, Thomas cut in, his voice wild and full of rage. I got his fiancée to fall in love with me, marry me, and give me a son. Again, Lucifer clapped. You killed your best friend, stole his woman, and produced a son to carry on your name. Serves the asshole right for kicking me to the curb like he did. I would gladly do it again, Thomas said in a strangled voice that was growing hoarse from the strain. There was a long pause, the tension so thick it was almost a physical obstruction between them. Watching more savage and selfish souls condemning one another to pain and misery, Lucifer wore a grin, looking at Thomas out of his peripheral view. Thomas? How much do you love your son? With a quick flash, they vanished from the frozen wasteland. Chapter 5 Circle of Fire Revisited Plumes of smoke billowed forth as they made their re-entry to the fire-laden prison. It was a jarring transition. Thomas wondered if this was how frozen dinners felt. Being near Lucifer in the circle of treachery, his body could still feel and had absorbed some of the bitter cold there. Then he remembered. No, not my body. My soul. The bodily form is just for show. Every inch of me in this place is my soul. And right now my soul feels like I'm standing in the middle of a huge campfire. Yoo-hoo! Hail to Thomas! Lucifer interrupted Thomas's train of thought. With flaming souls falling all around them, they stood looking over a lake of fire. The wailing and howling of souls in agony was present all around, but Thomas found that it was becoming white noise to him. Thomas! A desperate scream came from somewhere behind the pair. Thomas spun around to see Dave Jorgeson, a former employee of Manhattan Dynamics. Hey, Dave. I, uh, didn't know you were dead. Can't say I'm surprised to see you here, though. 
Dave stood between two high rock walls with his hands shackled and arms spread wide. The iron shackles hanging from the walls did not allow much slack in them, making the outstretched arms hang awkwardly. Thomas followed the tormented figure down to see that his balls were literally in a vice. Nausea rose up quickly in Thomas's stomach. The screw turned with a slow squeak while the two plates neared each other. What the hell did you do to be tormented like this? Thomas asked in disbelief. The vice was growing ever tighter and cries of agony leapt from Dave's throat. He was a very resentful and jealous man, Lucifer started. He always took more than his share, questioning anyone getting more than he received, and boldface lying about others when all else failed. Out of anger, he followed a co-worker home one night and beat him badly. He tied the co-worker's wife up and proceeded to rape her in full view of her husband. Battered, bruised, and feeling more violated than ever in her life, she wished this punishment upon him when he died. Thomas turned back to see Dave's penis removed with scissors and his eyes burned out with red-hot iron pokers right at the very moment the vice crushed his balls. Oh, as fucked up as this torture is, you deserve every bit of it. I hope you rot down here. Thomas spit at him and then turned away. Lucifer grinned and clapped a hand to his shoulder. How much do you love your son? I asked. Lucifer raised an eyebrow. Thomas flushed red and realized much too late that his face had already betrayed his thoughts. Lucifer, my son is off limits. You can't have him as part of any deal. Thomas barked as spittle flew. Lucifer's grin was ear to ear again. Don't you understand? You've already delivered him to me. All the things you tried teaching him about how to manipulate people to gain the best possible advantage for himself. All the lessons on how to make your feelings look convincing. He's shaping up to be a better prospect of delivering souls to me than you. Lashing out, Thomas's voice took on a threatening tone. Just stay the hell away from my son! Lucifer's laugh came from deep down in his gut. <laughs> Was that not supposed to be a hell pun? <laughs> oh, the fact of the matter is that I can sit back and watch him leave scars that drive people to me and wait for him to arrive. Pure panic had overcome Thomas. His eyes darted around as though there was a solution before him that he just wasn't seeing. Lucifer buttoned the jacket on the hand-tailored suit and began walking away. You weren't totally behaved during our time together, trying to throw me off a cliff in my own home and all. So, the terms of our earlier negotiations have been altered. You will get a reprieve of 80 years out of every millennium of suffering instead of 125 years as we previously agreed. I'll send you video clips of the deeds your son does that send other souls to join us. Whether it's corrupting individuals, committing adultery, theft, or hundreds of other sins, you'll bear witness to them all. I will, as a special treat, give you a glimpse of the torture he earns with each one. Should be a fun way to spend eternity, don't you think? I'll continue the process with all of your descendants. Undoubtedly, you'll feel less and less attached to them over time, but you will still know they are some extension of your bloodline. The terrifying details of everything Lucifer promised poured into Thomas's head faster than he could process. The light of his world that once fit in the crook of his arm. The infant who had stumbled and scraped his knee, crying out for his daddy when learning to walk. Comforting the young boy when he struck out in the Little League Championship, losing the game for his team. Thomas had not realized how quickly the years had gone. His son was a young man now, on the verge of being out in the world on his own. He had not realized until this moment what his son meant to him. As Lucifer stood laughing about the demise and torture of his son, Thomas's heart felt like it shattered into a million pieces, 
and each of those splintered into a million more. I can't wait for your son to join us, Lucifer said, chuckling. Wait, Thomas saw Lucifer snap his fingers. Then nothing. Chapter 6 The Doors Thomas stood locking his eyelids down against the vision of horrors that surely awaited him. For the first time in what seemed an eternity, it was silent all around him. Apprehensive of his surroundings, Thomas slowly released the locks on his eyelids to peer at his fate. He stood before an elevator in his office, the down arrow lit in red on a digital board above the open doorway. Thomas stood in disbelief. Had everything been a nightmare? His inner self creating the layers of hell to spark a change before his fate was permanent? He barely had time to ponder the thought before the wounds of the bite stung sharp and fresh. No. It had been real. Every miserable second of it. A whisper caressed his ear. If you enter the elevator, you will join me forever. However, your son will change his ways and live a happy, normal life. Or, you can take the stairwell to your right and save yourself. But everything I have said will come to pass. The now familiar hiss of Lucifer's voice left him to ponder. Thomas calmly turned around, walked over to his office, and poured himself a scotch on the rocks. The Johnny Walker blue slid down his throat, giving the familiar warmth in his chest of high-quality scotch. Thomas stood looking out over the city, wondering why it had taken so long for him to figure out the truth. The truth was that he was an asshole and a murderer. He had always told himself the lies and had even got to the point of believing them. His son's life and future eternal road now rested upon his decision. Why have I been such a bastard? Thomas questioned the empty room, sipping his scotch. Mind cycling through some of the horrible events of his life that Lucifer hadn't brought to light. Exposing an affair that one of the board members was having with his secretary so he could move up the chain. God, how long would it be before someone did the same to him? He deserved that, and so much more. He deserved to be pushed off the roof. So many lives, so many souls had been ruined or corrupted by him. Now, it was finally going to come to an end. Or would it? Would he really be able to be that selfless? His whole life was an exercise in self-advancement. Finishing his scotch, Thomas strolled back to the bar and poured himself another drink. Suddenly, an omnipresent voice boomed. If you're going to sit here and waste my time, then I shall make the decision for you and remove the hope of any rewards. Lucifer's voice was flat, but unrest was growing. Just one more drink, please. You waited this long for my choice. Try not to let the suspense kill me, Thomas said with his arrogant boss tone. You have five minutes to pick a way down. Otherwise, your son dies tonight and is mine forever! A haunting laugh echoed into nothing. Panic washed over Thomas's face. He didn't even feel the highball glass slip from his hand and shatter on the floor. He shook his head, regaining his composure. Or so he thought. Thomas reached for another crystal highball glass and dropped a couple of ice cubes in it. As he brought the neck of the decanter to the glass, they chattered off each other with light clinking. Thomas tried to steady his shaking hands, but it was useless. If he simply sat and did nothing, his son would die. But he would live. It completely removed the need for him to make a choice. If I just do nothing, then the responsibility isn't mine to bear, he thought. 
He knew that was simple and childish. Action through inaction is rarely the hallmark of a great man, he thought. He looked down at the chair opposite him, at his massive redwood desk. He remembered his 13-year-old son sitting there while Thomas chewed someone's ass out about poor quarterly numbers. The young prince, as his dad referred to him, had questions about how to handle a bully. Slamming the phone, Thomas turned to his son and immediately started his lesson. First, son, you find out what this kid's vulnerabilities are, then his fears, and finally, you leverage both against him publicly. This should shame him so greatly he never wants to mess with you again. If he does, you can exploit his fears even further. Show him that you are willing to go to a far crazier place than he is, and you'll never be bothered by him or anyone else again. After that, be charismatic and accepting to people. They will understand you're not to be crossed, but are someone they want to befriend. Thomas sat back and crossed his legs and tented his interlocked fingers simultaneously. Just like that, his heir understood what he had to do. Thomas II stood to leave. As he opened the door, his father's voice haunted him. Remember, son, information is the lifeblood of society. How detailed and accurate your information is will make all the difference. Make this bully pay, son. His son gave a nod and strolled to the elevator, pushed the button, and went down the elevator. The elevator, Thomas thought. Three minutes, a gravelly voice barked. Thomas sat down in his Italian leather chair when the next memory forced its way in. Thomas awoke from sleeping on the couch in his living room, the baby monitor casting a soft glow in his face. Thomas sat up trying to blink and rub the blurred vision of his sleepy eyes away. After blinking a few more times, his vision crystallized, and immediate dread flooded his whole body. There was his son, lying face down in the crib, motionless. Before he was even aware of it, his feet had carried him over the side of the couch, and he leapt to the second, no, no, the third step of the staircase. His long stride was devouring huge sections of the staircase in a controlled sprint. At the top of the stairs, he took the half-right turn to the hallway of the nursery. If some distances seemed to stretch during times of stress, Thomas noticed this was the opposite. He was clearing huge sections of the house effortlessly. Thomas was aware that the only sound present was the rapid thudding of his own heart. The hospital video about SIDS and babies sleeping face down playing on a constant loop in his mind. Thomas burst through the door with crazed concern for his young son. Thomas got to the edge of the crib, only to find that the young prince was fine. The monitor had given the appearance that his face was straight down, but his head was cocked to the side slightly, standing there in the sound of his son's low rhythmic breathing. Looking down, Thomas realized just how much this little guy meant to him. He slipped out of the nursery and sobbed. One minute left. Lucifer's voice jolted Thomas back to his office. The announcement came much louder this time. A flurry of memories flew past Thomas's eyes. First, bike rides, little league games, school plays, and a dizzying number of others. Leaning over his desk, tears flowed freely. Sobbing again as he had the day he ran to the crib. For all the memories seen, how many have I missed being here in the office? The tears flowed like never before. How could I have taken that little baby and walked him to the gates of hell? I brought his soul an eternity of suffering and damnation. Choking on his emotions, snot, and tears, the pedestal of lies that held him high now crumbling. Thirty seconds, Lucifer's voice assaulted Thomas. Fuck you, Lucifer! You can't have my son! Thomas's feet reached a full sprint, but brought him to the doorway of the stairwell. Standing before it, he weighed his life in so many thousands of lives in his hands. The future of his descendants rested on his next action. I can change my son if I get down from here, he thought. 
We'll move out of the city and never look back. The amusement of that simple thought made him smile. Tears streamed down Thomas's face. Even knowing all the horrible things I've done, I am still trying to save myself. Son of a bitch, I'm an asshole! Eyes bloodshot and face lined with tears, Thomas slammed the door. Five. Four. Three. Two. Thomas hurled himself into the elevator in a full sprint. Only moments after hitting the back wall, the door slammed shut. It began its descent. The cable snapped with the sound of a bullwhip, and the steel box plummeted until it hit the foundation. A crater was the final mark Thomas left on the world. Manhattan Dynamics conducted an investigation into the faulty elevator following the death of its CEO. Several building codes were found to be out of compliance. Thomas had been informed of the necessary upgrades that were going to be quite expensive. Not wanting to spend so much on the building, he found it was cheaper to pay off inspectors for false reports. He knew the elevators were out of code, yet he allowed everyone to ride them every day. People who worked for him and trusted that he was making the best choices for them. Mothers, fathers, young men and women, single and in love or lust. People at all different stages of their lives with their own things they held dear, rode the elevators every day, never knowing how close they were to death. Employees of the company raised a class action suit for hazardous work conditions. Manhattan Dynamics paid out millions. Thomas's corruption and attempt to give Manhattan Dynamics a healthier bank account cost the company millions. Thomas paid with his life and his soul. August 8th, 1991. The cultists calling themselves Baal Deva's Truth had become so efficient at home invasions that neither of Samantha's parents were able to call the police before they died. The firefighters with Engine 21 were the first emergency responders on the scene, and I was one of them that night. We arrived only after the neighbors called in reports that smoke was pouring out of the house's front windows, and by then it was mostly too late to stop the cultists' plan. Most of Baldeva's truth had already committed suicide, to spare themselves from burning alive. We only learned that they had been there when we found their bodies piled in the home's main foyer. We called for police as soon as we saw the corpses, but the billowing smoke urged us to continue inside without waiting for backup to arrive. The flames would soon begin to attack the building's structure. If it hadn't started to do so already, we had to press our way inside if we were going to contain the still spreading blaze. Otherwise, it would soon threaten more than just this house alone. I remember being sure of arson as soon as I was inside. The fire had been fed deliberately, and it had been built so that it might spread easily to their neighbors' homes as well. We moved past the bodies in the foyer in a frenzy to save the building. I remember feeling vulnerable without the police there. I was acutely aware that we firefighters might be attacked by anyone who was still alive in the house. We heard from the emergency report that a family of three was expected to be inside, two parents and an infant. The dispatcher's voice on our radios had specified, after the night of the incident, I did some research on the family in that house. I just couldn't get them out of my head. And so I learned later that the couple had just moved into town to begin raising their child. We found both parents bound to the heavy wooden chairs that they had bought for the dining room. 
even though their bodies are already burning by the time we fought our way in to the center of the house. It was plain to see that their hearts had been messily cut out of their chests. Their faces, too, looked to have been mutilated before the fire began. It was then that I realized that there was no baby present in the dining room there with the parents. She might still be alive. And so I sent my partner to the second floor, while I headed down to the wine cellar by myself. It was down at the bottom of the cellar stairs that I first saw Max Kafer, the leader of the cultists, heard me enter, and he turned to face me with the baby in his arms. Kafer had eyes like dying coals that were nearly drowned in the wet suit of his face. My fire axe was gripped in my hands, and I would have buried it in his chest had he not held the baby up in front of him. We're summoning a demon tonight, he told me flatly. It's mostly done already. He held the baby up as though he was going to throw it against the ground. While his arms were still raised, I dropped my axe and tackled Max Kiefer around his midsection. We fell together, but I managed to seize the baby gently from him before he hit the ground. Max rose up to take the child back but I struck him hard with my fist and he went down again. This time he stayed there, unconscious, but not dead. The police would arrive minutes later to collar him, along with the two cultists that were still alive upstairs. My partner did not survive finding those cultists up there first, though. To this day, I wonder why I sent him up there instead of going myself. The baby had been named Samantha by her parents, and that name was honored and kept when the child passed into foster care. I would have adopted her myself, except that I was entirely unprepared to raise a child at that time. I bought Samantha gifts on her birthday, though, and I visited the foster home on holidays to make the child feel that she still had a family. She grew to know my face, and she learned to trust me as the years passed. It was something like fatherly love that I felt for her in return, even though we weren't truly family to each other. Max Kafer went to prison, as did two of his followers who survived that night inside the burning house. They were the ones who killed my partner after I sent him to the second floor. To this day, I wish I had been better prepared to protect baby Samantha. More than that, though... I wish that I'd killed Max Kafer with my axe, while I still had the chance. February 17th, 2001 Her amber alert interrupted the evening news, and I recognized Samantha immediately. I searched the internet, investigating the terrible suspicions that were already creeping into my mind. After only a few minutes of research, I confirmed my worst fear. Max Kafer had recently been released from prison. Kafer's few surviving followers from that night claimed full responsibility for the murders and the arson. The only charges that stuck to Kafer were three counts of aiding and abetting. In the end, Max Kafer served less than ten years in prison due to good behavior while he was inside. He was a free man again, and I suddenly felt sure that I knew where Samantha could be found tonight. I knew who had taken her away. The burned-out house was condemned but still standing. Urban blight in the area had left the property in limbo, awaiting a demolition that was now almost a decade overdue. I arrived at that scene of that same 1991 arson just in time to see two figures entering the smashed-down doorway to the main foyer. It looked like a man and a child. I used my cell phone to call the police and report what I was seeing, but I couldn't just stand around while I was waiting for them to arrive. Samantha might be killed by the time that emergency responders made it to the house, and I did not want to be standing idly outside if my suspicions about Max Kafer were correct. 
The smell of gasoline hit me hard as I entered the house. Accelerant fumes were already heavy in the air and I knew immediately that Max was trying to finish what he started ten years ago. He wanted to burn the house to the ground once and for all. The entry foyer was different now, but it still brought up bad memories. There were no piles of dead bodies here anymore. Instead, there were only fire-damaged floorboards beneath my boots and countless oily slicks of gasoline zigzagging through the house. I thought immediately of the wine cellar. That's where Kafer meant to kill Samantha, and that is where he would likely go now. I moved quickly but carefully from the foyer to the dining room. As I passed through it, I saw that the dining room had changed too. No longer were the desecrated bodies of Sam's parents tied to heavy wooden chairs around the table. Instead, this room was empty now. As I squinted in the darkness, I realized that all four walls around me were covered from floor to ceiling with insane ramblings about Baldeva and the little girl. It was then that I realized that Max Kafer had likely been preparing this place for tonight's ritual ever since he got out of prison. I remember that cellar door was just beyond where I stood now. As I hurried forward, I did my best to muffle the sound of my footsteps. I did not want to alert Kiefer to my approach. I was also forced to hesitate as I reached the cellar door. It wasn't clear whether the damaged woodwork reinforcing those stairs could still support my weight. If the stairway collapsed underneath me, I would certainly be too badly injured from the fall to stop Kafer. Testing the top stair with one foot, I felt it shift gently beneath my boot. The woodwork below me let out a soft creak in response to my weight. I cautiously brought my other foot to bear on that same top step. There were no sounds of anything cracking or splintering below. Taking a deep breath, I began my descent into the cellar. Moving down the stairs, I found Kafer standing at the bottom with his back turned to me. Samantha was huddled against a far corner of the cellar, crying and trying to make herself small there. It pained me to see her so afraid, but I was also greatly relieved to find that she was still alive. Sam was hiding her face against her knees and pressing her eyes closed as she shielded them with the folded crook of her arm. Because she was crying this way, she did not see me coming into the cellar. Kafer also did not notice that I had descended the stairs behind him. He was rambling as though trying to drown out a voice that only he could hear. It was clear that Max Kafer had lost the last vestiges of his sanity during the time in prison. The man's deranged mind had plainly continued deteriorating over the ten years since I last saw him. Mixed in with the rambling, Max was telling Samantha that she needed to cooperate with him. He was telling her with anger in his voice that she did not need to be afraid. I'm sorry for what happened to your parents, little girl. We were trying to summon Baldeva, and we did summon him. I regret it now, he began chuckling dryly. <laughs> I regret it. I regret it so much. He turned his head and seemed to shout to an unseen third party there in the cellar. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! It was clear that Max still had not noticed me behind him. Was he talking to a demon? I searched for a weapon and I found that there was nothing within my reach. If it came to a sudden moment of decisive violence, could I really strangle this man with my bare hands? Another strong whiff of gasoline stung my nostrils and reminded me that the house was already fully staged to transform into an inferno. If Kafer began reaching into his pocket for some matches or a lighter, then I would only have seconds to neutralize him. Max took a deep breath as though to calm himself, and then continued talking to Samantha. Little girl, we really did summon Baldeva. He went into me, and for ten years he's been living inside my brain. 
I can't endure it anymore. Do you understand? That's why we're here. To reverse the spell tonight. Shut up! Shut up! He turned his head again to shout at the invisible third party that he apparently sensed nearby. In his frustration, Kafer reached into his unkempt hair and briskly tore a fistful of it out. If we finish what we started, Max said, then Beldeva can go somewhere else. He can go anywhere else. I could hear in his voice that Kafer was beginning to cry. The madman's defenses were lowered, and yet fear of the unknown stayed my hand. I had no way to be sure whether Max was armed with some sort of concealed weapon. If I were to attack at the wrong moment, I might doom both Samantha and myself by letting Kafer get the upper hand. Max Kafer began moving subtly towards Samantha. She was still huddled in that corner trying to hide herself from the reality that was now marching towards her. It was then that I lost all concern for myself. If Max had a knife, then he could try to stick it into me now. I took three careful steps forward, and then I wrapped my fingers around his neck with all of the force that I could muster, wrenching Kafer by the back of his neck. I threw him to the ground with all of my strength. Max had not sensed me there behind him, and so he was completely unprepared to defend himself. Kafer barely caught himself from falling flat onto his face as he went down, and in his confusion he remained prostrate against the ground for several seconds before he began moving to collect himself back up. Standing over Max Kafer... I raised my leg and then brought my boot down hard against the back of his head. I stomped again, this time driving my boot into the exposed curve of spine at the back of his neck. I put my full weight into each strike that I delivered to the downed man. I kicked him hard three more times before I stopped to check whether or not Max was even still breathing. He wasn't. It was at this point that I noticed the bladed weapon that Kafer had been holding. It was a serrated knife with a keenly honed edge, and it must have been palmed tightly in Max's right hand when he first started walking towards Sam. Samantha finally uncovered her face, sensing perhaps that something important had just happened. Sam looked up to see me standing there in front of her, and she recognized my face immediately despite her gladness to be saved. I could tell that her terror had not subsided. Samantha had previously only known me as a source of gifts and kindness. Now instead, she saw me looming over the broken body of a man that I had just killed. I saw her eyes change to reflect something frightening and cold. It was a look unlike any expression that I'd ever seen on Samantha's face before. We waited outside for the police together, and when they arrived, I did my best to explain everything that had happened. For the most part, it felt like a relatively happy ending to an otherwise completely terrifying evening. Samantha had undeniably been changed by something, though. The way that her eyes turned cold and harsh that night never went away either. Any time that I visited Sam after the events of that night, her eyes invariably held that same expression of strange detachment. Her personality became pitiless in ways that it had never been before. Was Samantha badly traumatized by what she'd been through that night? Or was it something else? I am not a superstitious man. But I think something strange must have happened when Max Kafer died. I remember checking his pulse while we were still down there in the wine cellar. I made sure that there was no shadow of a heartbeat for me to find on any of his pulse points. When the EMTs arrived, they naturally did their best to resuscitate Max anyway. Maybe they were successful in forcing his heart to beat a few more times before they moved him to the ambulance. That's the only rational explanation I could have for what I saw at the end of the night. Kafer's eyes opened as they were carting him off. 
and his head turned almost imperceptibly on his badly broken neck to stare directly at me. They had put Max's body on a stretcher and then brought him out through the front door while I was still talking to the police. The dead man's eyes tracked me that whole time, adjusting their angle as the paramedics passed me on their way to the ambulance. Was there really a demon inside Max Kafer? He said that the ritual was meant to cast the demon out of his brain and to send it anywhere else. If Baldeva is real, then where did it go? Could it have gone into Samantha? It feels crazy to even think about this, but her eyes are just so fiercely cold now. Even if there's a demon inside that child, I love her like one of my own. I will protect her forever. God damn you, Max Kiefer. Burn in hell. August 8th, 2011. Samantha left foster care as soon as she turned 18. She'd never managed to find a permanent family to adopt her. In a few cases, she was almost taken in by a family. But her behavior always caused the prospective parents to reconsider before the papers were signed. Apparently, this was usually because Samantha spoke earnestly during adoption interviews about the demon living inside of her. I haven't run into her since she aged out of the foster care program. Sam must have changed her name and moved away. Because I never see her around town or hear from her at all. I'm retired now. I don't fight fires anymore, and I never ended up with a family of my own. They say that time makes fools of all of us, and I guess I've become a prime example of that old adage being true. I'm just a lonely old man now, and like most lonely old men, I often think of the people I helped a long time ago. I tear myself apart sometimes wondering about why nobody else seems to remember me like I remember them. Seems like all the times I visited Samantha in foster care, she would have at least thought to check in on me now. Or she could have easily written me a letter, but she never has. I've only seen Sam once since she turned 18 and honestly wish that I hadn't. I was enjoying a long walk one evening when I saw her. It had been 20 years to the day since that terrible evening when her parents were killed, but she was saved. I remember smelling coarse smoke in the air before I noticed her there. Something nearby was burning. It was then that I recognized her. Samantha was hurrying down the sidewalk in the opposite direction as I had been walking. She was pacing quickly towards me with a broad, bright smile across her face. Her eyes were still empty and cold, despite the grin on her face. She seemed alertly cruel and strangely detached from reality. In that same distinctive way which I remembered from her last years in foster care, in my gladness to see her, I momentarily forgot that smell of smoke wafting over the wind was beginning to choke me. I held up my arms for a hug and yelled, Sam! She continued hustling forward with empty eyes and a detached smile, as though she had not heard me. As she got closer, she avoided me standing there on the sidewalk and brushed past me like she didn't know me at all. Samantha! I called after her, standing there with my empty arms still extended. I was truly heartbroken to think that she somehow did not know my face after everything we've been through. Without a word, Sam continued around the corner and was gone. I continued walking in the same direction I'd been going before. I felt dazed by my sudden encounter with Samantha and I didn't know what to make of it. I realized suddenly that that acrid smell of smoke was growing more powerful as I moved in the direction from when Samantha had appeared. As I moved forward, I could see the flames. A house was burning, 
There was a commotion of lights from parked emergency vehicles outside. I drew closer. The police had secured the perimeter and they would not let me approach any nearer than where I had approached the stand. Go home, pal, said the officer blocking my path. He held a flat palm to my chest. We're doing our best here already, and I doubt you're prepared to lend a hand. I used to be a firefighter, I answered honestly. But you're right. I'm too old to help anyone now. I pressed the officer for more information. Please, I said. Just tell me that everyone inside the house made it out okay. Before the officer could respond, wild screaming pierced through the clamor and chaos of the fire. It came from the top level of the burning house. I gasped in disbelief. <gasps> it was horrifying to realize that someone alive remained inside that inferno, and they were still trapped upon that second floor despite so much emergency response on the scene. There's people still inside, I cried out. Why the hell aren't they getting near the windows? They could try to jump down. The firefighters would catch them, at least get some fresh air from outside while they're waiting for the emergency responders to reach them. We think someone must have tied up the family inside before they set fire. The officer answered me matter-of-factly. His eyes cracked open slightly wider as he realized that he had probably said too much. Now get lost, he ordered. We're doing our best to get them out. Another fit of strangled wailing rang out from the house's second floor, and then faded into the crackling sounds of the fire. It was arson then, I said to myself. More demonic rituals. Taking one last helpless glimpse back towards the inferno, I turned around and went home. Back inside my own house, I locked the door behind me and then moved immediately to sit on my couch. I needed a moment to process everything that I had just seen. I didn't turn on any of the lights in my living room, and I left the television in front of me blank and inactive as well. I held the TV's remote in my hand, but I hesitated to turn the television on. There was a cocoon of darkness and silence wrapped around me in this instant and I could feel it shielding me from the horrifying realities that were just outside this impermanent bubble of isolation. My dread urged me to turn on the TV and start watching the news, but I didn't. I knew that I would regret learning anything more about this latest horrible case of arson in my neighborhood. A terrible realization arrived suddenly and it sent a new shudder of repulsion through my body. I realized that watching the news might also help me to understand the details of why Samantha was here in town tonight. She'd been missing until she appeared suddenly tonight, the anniversary of her parents' deaths. More than that, she had returned only to be seen hurrying away from the scene of a deadly arson. Samantha knew me for most of her whole life. She always recognized me right away, but tonight, she didn't seem to know who I was at all. It just didn't make any sense to me, unless a grim thought came suddenly into my mind. I remembered the way that Sam's eyes had changed on the night that I killed Max Kafer. Was it Baldeva that crossed my path tonight? Could it really have been a demon that was looking through Samantha's eyes as she marched past me with that smile on her face? I called Sam's name twice as she walked away. There had been no response at all. The woman that I had watched grow up for so many years truly didn't seem to know her own name anymore. Or if she did know it, then it no longer meant anything important to her. Max Kafer had been tortured to insanity by the demon, but in all the years since I first saw the change in Sam's eyes, she didn't seem to feel tortured by anything. During those last visits I made to the foster home before she turned 18 and skipped town, 
Samantha only seemed more and more ruthless. She had turned into something effortlessly sinister. I think that Samantha truly doesn't mind Bald Deva's presence inside of her. Maybe she's simply more receptive to demonic things than Max Kafer ever managed to be. The more I think about it, the more I realize that Sam must like having Bald Deva in her life. If she didn't like the demon so much, then she surely would have turned to me at least once and asked me for help in making it go away. She never, ever mentioned it to me. Whenever I would visit, I saw in Samantha only a dark confidence that was steadily and silently growing. She allowed herself to sink into a deep ruthlessness of spirit, and she would not acknowledge to me that the transformation was happening. I turn the TV's remote over in my hand as I think about the possibilities. Sam had been smiling so brightly as she walked past me. She was happy as she fled the scene of that burning house with those victims still bound inside. I take a deep breath. I finally made my decision. I stand up from my chair to toss the remote down where I had been sitting. I've already lost the closest thing that I've ever had to a daughter, and I refuse to suffer any more because of what that damned Max Kiefer brought into Sam's life. Even if Samantha decides that she wants to keep killing and drifting from town to town with Baldeva inside her head, then I could never try to stop her. I already promised myself a long time ago that I would protect Samantha. That means that I can't hunt her down or turn her in. Even if she's still out there sowing chaos and hurting innocent people, I won't turn on the news tonight or tomorrow night for that matter. I'll plug my ears when I hear a radio and I won't read the papers for at least a week. In fact, I might never read them again. I don't want to learn about what Samantha's done tonight, and I refuse to think about what she might do next. I cupped my face in my hands and exhaled slowly sweat dripping from my flushed skin. My hair hung from my scalp like golden seaweed, swaying gently in the sun. I felt sick. The sun filtered into the blinds like baked color, a slather of yellow across my covered eyes. I reached blindly to my right and pulled a cigarette from my pack. I kept my eyes closed as I lit it, no use watching me kill myself. I inhaled heavily, the thick smoke swarming my dry throat like a cloud of flies. Christ, it was hot. I looked around my barren apartment and pulled deeply from the filter between my lips. Bed. Chair. Table. Old TV. How pathetic. I lazily opened my eyes and rolled them to look at the piece of broken machinery jutting from my window. Fucking air conditioner. I didn't have the money to buy a new one, and so I sat and smoked and felt sorry for myself. What a fucking existence this was. I checked my watch and saw it had only been seven minutes since the last time I looked. What did normal people do on their days off? Through the ceiling, I listened to the couple who lived above me. They were fighting, a male voice booming through the thin wood. I licked my lips, smoke rising from my tongue, and grit my teeth. He was always yelling at her. I had lived in the shithole for two years and he was always fucking yelling at her. I swatted my neck, my hands coming away slick with sweat. My bare feet scraped against the hardwood floor and I stood, cigarette dangling from my lips. I went and leaned against the wall, the summer heat igniting the drifting smoke. I wanted a glass of water, but the kitchen seemed so far away. I squeezed my eyes shut against the sudden liquid burn and kept them like that for a while. When the sensation passed, 
I pulled my phone from my pocket and checked for notifications. Nothing. I shoved it back into my shorts and took another long drag. The asshole upstairs was still screaming at his girlfriend. Outside, I heard a car honk, followed by a very pissed off exclamation. I went to the blinds, the light slitting across my naked chest. I peeked down towards the street and saw some guy in a suit screaming from his Mercedes at an old man crossing the street. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but I could detect his tone just fine. My first thought was that it was way too hot to be dressed in a suit. My second thought was that the guy was a dick. I released the blind and ashed my cig onto the hardwood. Fuck it, right? Something upstairs thudded to the floor and I heard the girl cry out. I shook my head, sweat rolling down my spine. I made the journey over to my kitchen and drew a glass of water from the tap. I slurped it past my lips, the liquid unsatisfyingly warm. I checked my watch. Three minutes. Jesus Christ. I threw my spent cigarette into the sink and went over to the chair to retrieve another one. As I brought it to life, I could still hear the asshole in the suit screaming outside. What a way to spend my day off. I checked my phone again. Nothing. I told myself I should go out, go see a movie, something. I looked at the greasy light wafting in through the blinds and grimaced. Too goddamn hot to go outside. I sucked in smoke, my mouth filling with unpleasant flavors. I wiped my tongue with my teeth, coating them in a thin layer of toxic saliva. Another thud upstairs. More muffled yelling. Jesus fuck, how did anyone have the energy to be that angry? I slumped back into my chair, propping a foot on the windowsill next to the broken AC. I cursed it silently, staring daggers at its stupid, dead display. I realized I was chewing on my filter and stopped, drawing in another mouthful of black cloud. I placed a hand against my stomach, the bare skin damp and hot. I tried to remember when I had eaten last and found that I couldn't. I rolled my head back, sighing. Cooking was such a pain in the ass. <sighs> I wish I had a girlfriend to cook for me. I wish I had a girlfriend, period. Fuck, it was hot today. Suddenly irritated, I stood up and began to pace across the room, tossing my half-smoked cig in the sink and lighting another. I don't know why I was pacing, but I felt like I needed to. I had an exhausted energy rolling around in my chest, and I didn't know how to release it. So I paced. I scratched at the mop of wet hair on my head and my stomach growled. I ignored it. Whiny bastard. I pulled my fingers from tangles of clumping hair and checked my fingernails. I needed to cut them. I sucked at my cigarette instead, going back to the window. I looked out and saw the guy in the Mercedes was now out of his car and screaming into the old man's face. What a lunatic. Inhale. I coughed, the smoke wrapping itself around my dry throat. My eyes bulged and I dropped the cigarette onto my bare foot. A sudden bite of pain ripped through me and I jumped back, swearing furiously. I tried to calm myself, but I was sweating too hard. I stooped down and snatched up the still smoking butt. I gripped my teeth and slammed my eyes shut, trembling. Screaming from outside. Screaming from upstairs. Screaming in my fucking head. I could feel myself hyperventilating my chest rising and falling with dramatic gusto. I wedged the cigarette between my lips and peeled my eyes open. Curtains of smoke rolled lazily across the bland horizon of a meaningless existence. Trickles of sweat caressed my face and slid down my cheeks and neck. The slick yellow light filtering in through the window was like a poison, filling the room with unease and panic. I smoked my cigarette down to the filter and tossed it aside. I went to get another one and realized that I didn't have any more. I crumpled into the chair, eyes going wide, mouth feeling like it had been stuffed with sand. I dragged my teeth across my tongue, 
scraping sour residue from its surface. I spat miserably into the corner and then gagged. A crash from upstairs. The girl screamed, her voice rising to hysterics. I stood, body slathered in my own stench and fluids. My head began to ache, a dull poke in the back of my skull. I wanted another cigarette, and yet the thought repulsed me. The tips of my fingers shook as I decided what to do with them. Crash! She wasn't screaming anymore. I dragged a soggy hand across my brow and walked to the door. I pulled it open and entered the hallway, breath coming out in panicked gasps. A drum had begun to beat in my head, each heartbeat another note. I slunk to the end of the hall and padded up the old stairs. I left a trail of sweaty raindrops in the wake. I reached the top, the sounds of the fight growing louder. I balled my hands into fists, desperately sucking in wet air. The sun beat against my bare back as I plodded towards my neighbor's door. Hot tongues licked at my face from the foyer window as I reached my destination, one eye squeezed shut against the onslaught. I raised a fist to the door and beat on it, the same rhythm as the nightmare in my head. I didn't stop pounding until it opened. A twisted sneer met my assault, a middle-aged man who towered a solid six inches over me. I noticed that his knuckles were bloody his filthy teeth testament to the rot that was his existence. I had never actually seen him before, but this appearance confirmed my suspicions. He was a piece of shit. Quit beating on your girl, I vomited, my half-lidded eyes weighed down by sweat. What did you say to me? He said, pulling the door open a little more. I saw a woman curled on the kitchen floor behind him, she didn't look good. I leaned in towards his stench. I said, stop beating on your girl, cunt. His eyes lit up with unexpected fury, his teeth slamming into a snarl. You better watch how you talk to me, little man. I rolled my eyes. Oh, fuck this. I crunched my knee into his balls as hard as I could, bringing forth a gasp of absolute agony. The big man fell to his knees, eyes bulging in shock, little sounds of desperation escaping his lips. He teetered over and mirrored the woman's fetal position perfectly. I brought up my foot and began to stomp on his head, each blow accented by a grunt of pain from the bastard. Fuck, I hate you, I muttered, my heel annihilating his nose. I didn't stop until he was dead. Gasping, completely out of breath, I pulled strands of clinging hair away from my face and wiped the fresh sheen of sweat from my face. Blood pooled in the hallway, the man's face a bloody mass of pulpy gore. Teeth littered the threshold of his apartment like tiny red candies. I glanced at the woman inside and met her shocked gaze. You don't have to cry anymore, I said, only half listening. She didn't move just stared with a look of complete horror at what I had done. I turned and left, blinded momentarily by the scorching sun. I needed a cigarette, in the worst kind of way. I walked down the stairs, leaving bloody footprints. I almost slipped, but somehow caught myself before I went down. I snorted. I entered my apartment and plopped myself down in the all-too-familiar chair, still catching my breath from the incident upstairs. I searched myself briefly for some kind of feeling. My phone buzzed in my pocket. Heart leaping in my chest, I pulled it out. <laughs> Work wanted to know if I could come in early tomorrow. I started to laugh. And when the police eventually came for me, I was still howling. Chapter 1 Blake and Danny's Dark Tourism Welcome to Helltown, Ohio. 
The dripping letters and numbers appeared to have been spray-painted over the original town's name and stats. Population, 3 million plus. Elevation, minus 6,666. A nice place to visit. A better place to live. I laughed out loud at the advertisement of millions of souls inhabiting Helltown happily below sea level. At almost negative 7,000 feet, it certainly qualified to be the depths of hell. The earthly inhabitants appeared to have long disappeared as the placard stood off-level and unmaintained. Its metal posts were twisted and the billboard dented on its edges and corners. It leaned sadly to its side, adorned with a multitude of bullet holes. The steel carcass long rusted underneath its faded green background now lent the appearance of barely an ability to be standing on its own. Nature's cancer had left it behind to die slowly along the deserted highway. Trails of weathered brown stains bleeding down the Marquis's face resembled tears from the decades of an ignored state of disrepair. Looking out past the town's once proud billboard of welcome, I cracked another smile to myself. Carefully, of course, knowing Danny took this whole undead business very seriously. This is where our adventure would begin, our attempt at searching out scary sights of horror and macabre lore. This place, this hell town if you will, held several legends to explore and seemed to be a popular destination for this new type of horror-seeking vacationers. A group we had now invested ownership in by traveling long distance from Missouri for the faint chance of having the shit scared out of us. I'd been hoping for sand and Florida beaches or even Mexico, but Danny thought that sounded too ordinary. There would be no rolling ocean waves or umbrella drinks on Che's lounges this time, but hey, this destination boasted a slew of everything including a haunted cemetery, a community of chemically plagued walking dead zombies, and huge pythons. It didn't even stop at that. There were also satanic cultists practicing sacrificial offerings in the Old Town Church. And let's not forget the haunted bridge, complete with an undead toddler skittering around its structure nightly. Who could say no to this, right? I looked over at Danny, my fiancé, and she smiled. Granted, it was a nervous smile, but she'd asked for this. The entire idea had been all hers. I parked alongside the road where the highway was blocked by railings that were nailed into large wooden posts. What followed on the backside was several huge boulders. It felt like a second warning, ensuring any would-be trespasser to take heat, because you weren't welcome if you hadn't understood this by the first obstacle. Just across these barricades, one old highway led off to the left, and on our side of the blockade, the newer road continued to the right. A dilapidated old church was surrounded and propped up by tree branches, slowly swallowing the building's remnants with its limbs and roots. The holy structure barely holding itself in place as it leaned, slightly left, and cantered toward us. I imagined giant octopus arms intertwined, constricting what little life was still left. The once beautifully color-stained windows were mostly long busted out, leaving only shards of dagger-like pieces to dissuade the outside elements from entering in. Eerie darkness spilled from its opening as the large front entrance lay gaping wide. It should be screaming out in pain and horror, and even the thought nudged me to stand still several moments, concentrating my ears to search for such sounds. But only silence answered back. To the left of the church, alongside the abandoned highway, sat an old school bus. The yellow paint losing its battle with decay allowing the rust to take its grip and feast on its metal body, leaving gaping open wounds. I looked over to Danny. Well, babe, we're here. Goodbye swimsuits and cool water. Hello, Helltown. The dark adventure begins now. I lifted my leg over the railing and turned my gaze to her, offering my hand to assist. The sky was clear except for a few dark scattered clouds to the south. The dense, humid air was almost deafening, as nary a sound of another soul was acknowledged. There were no birds chirping or crickets chattering. Only emptiness and the heat of the day's soaked sun surrounded us. It looked as if we owned the entire area to ourselves. I couldn't remember when we had passed another car 
or seen so much as a gas station alongside the road. We were deep in the boonies of the Cuyahoga Valley. I could almost hear dueling banjos playing in the distance like Burt Reynolds and his friends heard in the movie Deliverance. The opening scene just before their personal hell swallowed them up, surrounding them in a terror some would end up not surviving. I shook the feeling off with a nervous smile as the banjo played on inside my head. Blake? Danny hesitated as she grabbed for my hand and lifted her left leg over the metal guard. I know... I... I know that this was my... um... my idea. Her eyes searched until they met mine square, her teeth biting at her lower lip. Do you, do you think this is smart? I mean, now that we're here... It's already very late in the afternoon, and no one else is around. I expected to see other adventurers. I saw an authentic concern and hesitation in her beautiful dark green eyes. I know I sound like a baby now, but... I smiled, and her gaze lightened in tone just a bit. Never mind. We'll be okay. You would never leave me anyway. No, Danny, I would never leave you. I love you, sweetie. We're a team that is irreplaceable. She placed her other hand on my shoulder for balance and finished clearing her body onto the side of the railing where I stood. She leaned in, tightening her arms around my neck, pulling herself closer. I could feel her warm breath on my skin just below my ears. The heat it held, along with the softness in her sigh, drew me in to hug her tightly and offer assurance. Babe, we don't have to do this if you're uncomfortable. Blake. She interrupted. I didn't have you drive for nine hours to come this far just to turn around. She pushed back and smiled at me. I'm okay. It was my idea. And there's no way I'm not following through. I've dreamed for this day to finally arrive far too long to go home now unanswered. She moved her hands from around my shoulders and grabbed me, leading us toward the church with vigor. Oh, look! The website was right! There's the upside-down crosses over the door and below the steeple roof. Watch out for any sacrificial devil worshippers. Last one in gets to watch the other's heart get eaten! She giggled. As we walked closer, we could see the paint was completely gone from the lap siding. The wood was stained with mold and rotted piles of chip paint lay stacked around the foundation. It was difficult to imagine how this church would have appeared back when it was painted a brilliant white. I tried to picture a manicured yard surrounding it and free from the crooked limbs and knotted roots which now choked its life slowly from existence. Carefully stepping through the opening and dodging spider webs and debris, I noticed the slow, scary, creaking sound of the door opening was missing. Reason being, it lay broken off its hinges, cast to the side like a defiled and defeated guardian. It felt almost sacrilegious, the state this church had been allowed to fall into. It did make it even a more fitting place for worshipping the dark angel instead of God. I briefly wondered if even the Almighty felt sorrow at the destruction of his house. The wind had been still and silent until the moment I stepped past the threshold. Suddenly I could feel a cool breeze and it only felt colder after Danny followed me inside. Wow, it feels nice in here. I thought it would be stuffy and hot. Danny stated. Funny, it was hot and dank at first. The breeze didn't cool things off until I fully stepped through. Are you messing with me, Blake? Really? I mean, maybe it's all the spirits of the victims who were sacrificed could be their cold souls and trapped within these walls. She poked me in the back and chuckled. I'm dead serious, Danny. Shh. Danny's ears perked and her eyes became focused as she scanned the large sanctuary. Several pews were shoved in groups against the walls, while others lay broken and scattered about. What, babe? Did you hear that? She held her finger to her lips as if to shush me again. I felt a chill travel the length of my spine. Hey, are you messing with me now? Don't tell me you don't hear those, those children's voices, uh, squeals and, and giggles. Danny kept her smile hidden until she finally turned and showed her face to me. Danny, you bitch. You had me for a minute. I smiled but found little humor in it when it came right down to it. I knew I'd felt weird cold chills hovering around me, and I was beginning to think I'd started to hear kids' giggles myself, and that was before she ever mentioned them. Oh, Blake. Who's the chicken shit now? 
I'm gonna have to rethink this whole engagement thing if you're gonna be such a fraidy cat. I never took you as the pussy type. I mean... She giggled again. I lightly stepped further into the room, dodging some oddly placed sticks and stones, knowing they could indeed break bones. Chuckling to myself at the odd timing the old nursery rhyme entered my thoughts. I noticed the altar lying directly in front of us. There appeared to be some small bones and feathers piled on a stone slab in the center. The lectern laid toppled on its side to the right and bore a drippy red spray-painted pentagram on its dusty walnut front. It was displayed directly over a wooden cross that was carved into its face. The paint was brown from age and exposure. Obviously, it wasn't all that old, though. Certainly not as old as the legend read of the church's inception. I remember reading that Satanists had taken over the church early in its beginnings. Spray paint wasn't available back in 1806 when Boston Township was founded and the Roman Catholic Church, Mother of Sorrows, was erected. Danny and I had researched this area several weeks earlier on all the legends and spooky tales involved before deciding to take our vacation trip to check this place out. The haunted school bus where children's voices could be heard, the cemetery where the old man ghost sat on a bench or wandered the grounds aimlessly, and of course, Crybaby Bridge, where a distraught mother threw her young toddler into the river. Legend has it that if you parked your car on Crybaby Bridge and took your keys with you, when you returned, your car would be running and locked. The hood and top would be covered in dust with fresh baby's footprints embedded. We plan to check out as many of these scary legends as possible. Blake, it's getting really cold in here. I think I'm ready to move on and check out the school bus. I agree, it's chilly. Must be an underground spring or something. The polluted one that caused the mutants to grow red pupiled eyes and the thirst for human flesh? Danny asked. Yeah, zombies that want nothing but our blood. <laughs> the sun suddenly dipped behind a cloud and simultaneously painted the sanctuary pitch black for several seconds. Well, that was eerie. Blake, I'm ready to call it good and move on. It's just the spirits trying to enhance the experience for you, babe. As I made my way towards the door, I noticed what looked like a blood trail on the floor. Trips gathered into dried puddles periodically on the dingy, dust-covered boards. What made them stand out was that some of the puddles seemed to be underneath the layers of dust, while others clearly sat on the top layer. I leaned down, pulling my knife from its sheath and pointed my flashlight toward the area in front of my knee. Using the blade and gently lifting a drip that appeared to sit on top, I easily scooted it to the right. To my surprise, the droplet stayed intact. Danny, come here, look at this. I heard the soft crunch of her footsteps, her shadow darkening the area in front of me slightly. What? What are you looking at? I'm not sure. It looks like dried blood drops. But do you see what I see? Blake, stop trying to scare me. I'm ready to move on. It looks like lantern oil or something to me anyway. Danny, I'm dead serious. Look, this is odd. The blood or oil, it's dry. It's obviously been here for a long time. Oddly though, if not impossible, some of it dried on the top layer of dust and some trips are dried underneath the dust. How does that happen? I took the edge of my knife and scooted the droplet, sliding it onto the top dust layer, exposing more droplets underneath. If this blood... Or oil. Danny interrupted, sounding curt with her comment. Okay, fine, I replied. If this is oil, it was all from the same body or container, I retorted pointedly. It would have pooled together and mixed, not dried, and then given enough time for dust to settle before another drip could fall. It doesn't make any sense whether it's blood or oil. Don't you find that odd? Yes, it's odd, okay? Let's just go, Mr. Scientist. I don't like the feeling I'm getting in this place. I don't want to add our layer of blood on top for the next dark tourist to find and then question how in the hell it ended up here. Let's get out. To me, it suggests different sacrificial killings at different times and... I stopped voicing my opinion when Danny turned, got up, and began walking away. Okay, I agree. It's downright creepy in here. I sheathed my knife and turned to lift myself up off my knee. The dim light flickered and I thought I saw a shadow pass across one of the glassless windows. 
Did you see that? Yeah. Oh my god, Blake. You're right, okay? I saw what the blood drops could possibly be. Now, can we just get the fuck out of here? Danny said with building anger. No, Danny. I mean, that shadow that just passed. <sighs> Screw you, Blake. I'm leaving. Danny began to move more briskly towards the door, which was on the opposite side of the window I had seen the shadow. Someone's out there, Danny. Wait a minute. She stopped cold. In a whisper, she spoke as she turned back to face me. Did you hear that? Twigs snapping. Danny's eyes instantly filled with fear. What do we do? Something is out there. Chapter 2 Tension Grows Outside the church's structure, I thought I noticed another black shadow as it moved past a second window. Leaves crumpled under the footsteps, and the sounds continued. There were more footsteps that followed briskly behind, but no voices. Had other tourists showed up while we were inside? On the front side of the church, I led and Danny followed, almost on top of me. Once we were several feet from the front door, I looked toward the bus on the right and then panned my eyes towards my Jeep Explorer. It still sat parked, appearing undisturbed. Well, no visitors other than us, babe. Must have just been our imaginations. You know, a case of the jitters. Do we want to check out the bus or head for a jeep? The sound of children giggling erupted in taunting voices and echoed from behind the old school bus. Danny reached for my hand. The jeep. Let's hurry. She led us into a fast-paced jog once we cleared the roots, which dipped in and out of the ground like serpents grouping together in a coiled ball. She nor I looked back until we hurdled the roadblock, each of us reaching our respective doors. I shoved my hands into my pocket for the keys but found nothing other than change jingling. Danny, give me the keys. I don't have them, Blake. You drove, remember? I don't have them. Chapter 3 Unraveling I looked over the top of the jeep, then back to the church we had just come from. My hands still inside my pockets nervously searching for keys I didn't remember putting there. I peeked inside the window of the vehicle. Damn it! What? Blake, hurry. I'm scared, okay? If you're joking, stop. It's not funny anymore. They're in the damned ignition. I pulled my right hand out of my pocket and pulled the door handle, praying it was unlocked. Check your door, Danny. I tried again and then moved to the passenger door on my side. Locked. Keep trying the passenger door. I looked back across the hood to the church and I saw movement in the darkened shadows of the trees. Quick, Danny, try the hatch. There is something coming around the church. Hurry. I threw my backpack on the hood of the jeep, fumbling with the zipper, trying to quickly open it. I heard a click and looked back to see Danny crawling into the hatch as she quickly cleared the back seat, moving forward. I withdrew the Glock 21 45 caliber ACP from my pack, quickly grabbing the strap of the bag and moved backwards to the driver's door, pulling on the handle. Hurry, Danny, open my door. I looked toward the church again, this time seeing nothing. The jeep door clicked and I swung it open and jumped in, throwing my bag and firearm onto Danny's lap. In a flash, I twisted the key, bringing the jeep to life. Stomping the gas pedal to the floor as soon as the gear shift slammed into drive, the rear wheel spun, throwing gravel and debris behind us. Holy shit! I screamed as the rubber connected with the asphalt, squealing the tires and fishtailing us onto the highway we had just come from. My heart was pounding as I looked at Danny and then up to the rearview mirror. Was this real or did we just get spooked? Was there really something back there? Danny's eyes were full of tension. She was shaking with nervous energy, her breaths still frantic and unsteady. I... I... my god, I... <sighs> she reached over and slugged my arm hard with force. Oh, you fuck! Why did you bring me here? <sighs> she burst into full-blown tears of panic, mixed more than likely with relief from our escape. My Blake! The jeep began to lurch and lose power. It coughed and sputtered, jumped and sputtered again. Oh shit! I instinctively looked at the gas gauge. Empty. Son of a... Blake, don't play this game. 
her eyes wide open as she turned to look behind us, spying the roadblock and abandoned church still in view not that far behind. Bleak. <laughs> Sniffles overtook her words along with heaving, shaken breaths. No more games, baby. I want to get as far away from here as we can. I know, Danny, but I'm not playing games. I stared into the rearview mirror, expecting to see blood dripping zombies or whatever we had caught a glimpse of that sent us running. Do you remember how far back up the road a gas station or something was? Anything that could help us? She punched me again and again in the arm as the jeep sputtered its last gasp. I coasted her off to the shoulder onto the grass, still in sight of Helltown's entrance. I saw the church steeple rising above the treetops. The place we had thought to have escaped from unharmed was only a couple of thousand feet behind. There wasn't anything for miles, Blake. She spoke in broken words between catching her breath. She looked out over the horizon of hills and trees. It's, it's going to be dark soon, isn't it? She pounded on the dash as she buried her head into my shoulder. We're going to be okay, Danny. These are just legends made up to scare people, thrills to speed heartbeats. They're not real. There are no ghosts, no mutants from the toxic spill, or satanic worshippers hungry for human sacrifices. It's all lore and legend. I pulled her closer, squeezing her as tight as I could from the seated position we were in. Look at me, Danny. I pushed her forehead back so she could see my face. I promise, baby, I'm going to keep you safe. And I won't ever leave you. Now, do you remember anything on the other side of the bridge up ahead? Gas station, house, anything? Danny slowly turned her eyes back to the road ahead, her breaths more stable but still fluctuating occasionally. As she turned back again, staring into my eyes, she began to speak. Oh, no. What, Danny? Her hand lifted, and she began to stretch out her finger, pointing toward the road ahead. Her lips trembled and her eyes dropped and formed a look of sudden defeat. Danny's finger finally stretched completely straight and trembled in an unsteady shake as she spoke. Cry. Cry, baby. Bridge. That is when our predicament truly swept over me. We were trapped. Helltown was behind us, dark forests filled with trees on either side and a river in front. A car out of gas that we sat in and only a haunted bridge to cross the river that would separate us from the spook-filled town and home. A town where we had seen weird blood drops and creepy shadows of possible toxin-poised mutants stalking the area. A bridge where, according to local lore, a crazy woman tossed her baby over into the river for no known reason. A bridge that now supposedly held ghosts of that horror from the past, somehow left stranded to terrorize anyone who parked on it and got out. Well, we weren't parked on it, but we were damn sure close. The legend said that if you parked on the bridge and got out with your car turned off, upon return, your car would be running, doors locked, and dust. Baby tracks. Well, shit. What to do? What to do? Chapter 4 A Plan Nobody Likes We sat in silence as the sun continued its slow fall behind the horizon in front of us. Not one single car had passed, nor did anything break the stillness around us. Neither Danny or I held any words to speak. I knew she'd blame me for all of this. Even though this dark tourism was her passion, by no means mine. Somehow, though, the outcome of this ordeal suddenly felt neatly laid upon my plate. I glanced over at her, slightly bitter as she silently stared out her window. I glanced into the rearview mirror toward Eldown. I could still see where the road veered to the left off the highway, the sinking sun reflecting from the town's placard. That sign that had the balls to display their farcical creed, a nice place to visit, a better place to live. Yeah like hell it was. The welcoming committee for this place sucked. One thing kept going through my head as we sat in silence. The sun would soon be leaving us and darkness would take its place. Nightfall and Helltown did not seem a good fit together, especially with what we had just experienced in the late afternoon sun. 
I imagined it could only get worse. Danny would not go walking back from the direction we had just come, and how could I blame her? We held no clues what lie past Helltown on the highway to the right anyway. Venturing off into the wilderness, away from the highway to our left or right, was not an option either. The only viable solution was to walk across the damned bridge and head back from whence we had first come, looking for anyone who could help us. We weren't parked on the bridge and our jeep was out of gas, so the legend didn't really fit our circumstances. Danny. I looked her way and waited for her to respond. Nothing. I reached over and cupped her hand with mine. Danny. We have to do something. I suggest we leave our vehicle and walk forward. Surely we'll stumble onto someone willing to help us. We're in the fucking heartland of America. People are good neighbors here. I paused and waited. Silence. We can't just sit here and do nothing. I'm not crossing that haunted bridge, Blake. I won't allow myself to witness that innocent baby being tossed over the railing by some whacked out bitch, even if they are just ghosts no longer human. I can go look for gas, and you could stay locked up in the jeep with my handgun if you'd rather. What the hell happened to you? I won't ever leave you, Danny. I love you. She asked as her eyes began to aim daggers at me. I reached under the seat and pulled out my other Glock, a G36 Slim, the same caliber as my G21, only more compact. Blake, what the hell? I didn't know you had another Glock. We can either take it with us and each be armed as we walk across that damn bridge. Together. I paused. Or I leave it with you and I go alone. Those are the only legitimate options. I want you with me. That's my preference. You'd really leave me here alone while you take off across that haunted bridge and leave me trapped in between two scary ass sights. In the dark. By myself. She guffawed. Wow. That's some damn true love right there. I guess in a way, it's a good thing we took this trip. I'm glad I'm finding out your lack of loyalty and love for me before we actually tied the eternal fucking knot together. Danny, damn it. That's not fair. I'm trying to do the best I can. I don't want to leave you. I want you beside me. But we can't just sit here and wait. It's been an hour, and no one or nothing has so much as made a noise, let alone driven by. I think society has ceased existence out here. Do you really want to just sit in place in the pitch black, waiting for those damned goons to make their way here if they do exist? Come with me. The bridge legend doesn't even fit our circumstances. We weren't parked on the bridge and the Jeep doesn't have any fuel anyway. It can't run. And who cares about dust and footprints? Who gives a shit? My voice was rising and I hated that fact. I forced myself to tone it down. I'm scared, Blake. If we get out of this, don't ever let me talk you into another ghost adventure. Please, don't ever take me anywhere like this ever again, even if I beg you, which I won't. She began to open her door as she carefully looked around. <sighs> Give me the fucking Glock, damn it. We both climbed out of the jeep and looked back as the last of the sun sank below the horizon. If it were different circumstances... I know we'd both see the beauty in the pink and orange sky slowly darkening while the tops of the hills gleamed a streak of beautiful crimson red as it became swallowed up by the blackness. There was no bright moon shining its beacon of hope, only scattered shimmering stars beginning to twinkle above. We both began walking towards the bridge, hand in hand, each packing a forty-five in our other hands. Chapter 5 What the hell was that? The burbling of the river became an audible sound about thirty yards into crossing the seam of the bridge. It felt like a stab at breaking the silence when Danny suddenly asked me the question. So, would you have really left me back in the car, alone? Danny, do you really want to go there now? I mean, we're not out of the woods. While I don't totally buy into all these mutant children of the corn crap, we are stuck here without wheels. Out of gas, in the middle of fucking nowhere and the sun has left us in the dark. Why did you bring me here then? What was your drive to make this trip? I could hear a seriousness in her voice. The question wasn't just to break the silence and make the walk go by faster. She was searching for real reasons. We were going to have that long conversation involving the old, why do you say you love me, conversation. 
I did, uh, I mean, I do love her. At least I think I do. Danny, I don't want to go there. Not ever, and certainly not now. You know I love you. I would have left both handguns with you if it came down to it, but- You've told me several times that you wouldn't leave me no matter what. The footsteps forward stopped and she turned. Maybe... Just... Maybe we should put a hold on plans. I don't know what to say other than this conversation needs to stop, right? There was a sudden shrill squeal before there was the sound of a loud water splash, as if someone had hurled a large rock into the river. I immediately pushed past Danny and quick stepped to the bridge wall and peeked over. The slow moving river was a dark empty blackness winding through light stones that glimmered from the star's reflection. Without enough light to truly make out what was below in the dark gurgling water, I pulled a small mag light from my pocket. Shining it down onto the water's surface, I swore I saw rings echoing outward from the middle of the flowing liquid, but I saw no sign of what would have caused it as it quickly dissipated into the dim blur of movement. The sound of footsteps disappearing into the distance drew my attention back to the bridge's surface. I fully expected to see Danny walking away from me, but I wasn't certain which direction she would have chosen. I knew she was disappointed in me. Our relationship was suffering through the weirdness and tension of our first trip together alone. My mind was scattered and twisted, thoroughly confused and fatigued. I pointed the beam toward the jeep and much to my surprise, Danny was still standing only a few feet from me. I turned to the far side of the bridge, expecting to see nothing but a darkened horizon of empty road disappearing into the blackness. What I saw instead was the frantic movement of what appeared to be a glowing aura surrounding a lone woman with flailing arms, her back to both of us. As the light hit her image, she faded somewhat, and a distraught squeal could be heard in the distance again. Looking back to Danny, I could tell she saw her too. This was not my imagination. Danny was frozen like a statue, her eyes large white orbs bulging with fright. We were both glued to watching the apparition walk in erratic circles as if dodging my beam of light before she turned and stared at us for a moment. As if caught, she turned away and evaporated into the silent stillness of the night. In the few seconds we stood trying to understand what we had just experienced, a subtle breeze began to softly blow. It was unnoticeable at first, but it became stronger, as if the bridge were funneling the breeze like a wind tunnel, causing the gust to build in strength. It felt very cold on my ankles, and when I looked down, illuminating the area with the flashlight, I could see a light dusting of a grayish substance collecting across the floor of the bridge. Danny spoke my name with an odd calm, and when I glanced over, I saw her lips moving, yet no words spilled from her mouth. It suddenly felt like the world instantly existed only in slow motion. We held absolutely no control over any part of what was taking place. Danny's arm lifted and moved deliberately in front of her, and it drew my attention. My eyes rolled upward, watching her finger extend out as if to direct my vision to follow. Instinct forced my eyes to track it out to the distant side of the bridge she was pointing. Their tiny movements on the ground captivated my attention. I felt the muscles in my face instantly release their constriction as my mouth fell helplessly open. I spontaneously pinched my eyes closed as if it would erase the sight I was witnessing. I tried two or three more times, each attempt failing to make the sight disappear. Chapter 6 Watching Baby Steps Tiny damp footprints soaked up the dust, leaving an awkward trail of a baby's path moving toward Danny and me in an odd and indirect approach. My brain attempted a warning, begging my body to take heed and run. Brain waves crossed in the middle of this unprecedented quandary and left my muscles too jellified to move. I was amazed I was still in an upright position. I just stood there, completely mesmerized, watching tiny foot tracks wobble back and forth to and fro. They left a map imprinted of where they had come from, sunken and dripping in the sheet of dust. I wasn't scared, although my heart pounded loudly. I swear it reverberated between the concrete bridge walls, resounding in my chest like listening to a subwoofer throb out a deep pounding bass from some young punk's car at a stoplight, pounding inside my torso, uninvited and causing involuntary palpitations. The sight evaded the ability to frighten me. Blake! 
Danny's voice seemed very distant, as if it came from one end of an empty auditorium, taking its time to reach me. Blake! My name echoed from behind, thundering louder as if time had somehow reversed the mechanics of how audible waves work with its relationship to my ears. My brain told me if Danny's voice came from behind, the second echo should be quieter, not louder. I felt confused and completely hypnotized by what I was witnessing. This impossibility of what I was experiencing. Footprints dancing awkwardly with no body or feet attached. Blake! My name suddenly assaulted my ears with booming resolve. Run, Blake! My moment of confusion snapped and smacked me in the face with a cold dose of reality. The tiny footprints came rambling closer to me. No visible or physical means to leave them in the dust. The actuality of the phenomenon hit me. I turned back and saw Danny's terrified expression pleading with me to save myself, quickly acknowledging it could be for me to then save her. I forced my muscle and nerve structure to cooperate, helping me to indeed run. Once we had left the edge of the bridge and made it closer to the safety of the jeep, we both turned back to the bridge in unison. The rambling footsteps halted. Two tiny big toes were imprinted in the dust at the bridge scene. Neither passed the expansion joint between it and the road's asphalt, refusing to cross the finish line of the race. We looked at each other in an odd moment of calm. We were safe and now heard an oncoming vehicle. Maybe we would be saved by a passersby. Again, collectively, we turned toward the highway to face what was oncoming. A dark roadway lay empty in front of our view. The interior of the jeep's windshield was fogged over as if the air conditioner was left running on high. The vehicle that held no fuel in its tank was now idling before us, purring like a kitten nestled in a warm lap. Danny sobbed. She turned to face me. We're gonna die here tonight. Her expression hollow and sober. Aren't we? Her question hung in the empty space between us. My heart was pounding to a tempo I'd never felt before. I was almost to the jeep when I turned to answer her question. I'm sure as hell not going to lay down and die. It'll take more than footprints from a baby or some apparition of the worst mother of the century guarding our exit. I stepped up to the driver's door and tugged on the handle. It was locked. Damn it! I said aloud. Danny lifted her handle and it was also locked. She reached for the passenger door. Locked. Just about the time she rounded the corner from checking the back hatch, there was a loud smash. Danny looked up as the driver's door glass shattered. The large rock I bashed it with now sat in my seat. I reached inside and opened the door, quickly brushing glass from my seat, tossing the rock to the side of the road where I had found it. This night couldn't get any worse, could it? Chapter 7 The Argument we heard the crunching of grass echoing from across the road. Just as I turned toward the brushy area, it occurred to me that we had forgotten one of the legend's horrors surrounding the Helltown lore. The Peninsula Python, a snake created through mutation from the Krejci chemical dump that closed this town in the Cuyahoga Valley in 1986. Based on the sound coming from the blackness of the forest, if it were a snake, it had to be huge. It could also be a satanic worshiper stalking us from the cover of the tall weeds, looking to capture an enthusiast of dark tourism to offer up to the devil. A thought neither Danny nor I had considered, or at least that's what I thought. We were just foolish posers, bored with the usual weekend in Missouri, and just out to experience something other than the ghost-inhabited Pythian Castle or the haunted albino farm, both in Springfield could also be mutant zombies, like the dark silhouettes I now believed were not figments of our imaginations as I had earlier thought. Danny! I hollered as I got in the car and reached over to unlock her door, seeing her run past the windshield. Get inside the car! As soon as her butt hit the seat, I revved the engine before shoving the gear shift into drive. The jeep lurched forward again, chirping the tires on the asphalt, and I wasn't going to slow down until we were far past the bridge and on the other side of this hell, which refused to loosen its grip on us. It didn't matter if the toddler's body who left those prints became visible. This vehicle wasn't going to stop for anything. 
At least that was my intention. But intentions don't always meet the reality as strategized. My trusty jeep shot forward past the footprints that had ended at the seam of the bridge and road, leaving a horrid thump and bump as we crossed. I could feel what must be the undead toddler rolling and bouncing underneath the floorboard of the vehicle like if I had hit a small dog that had shot out in front of us, its legs flipping and rolling below us. I felt every bump and thud. The only thing was, I had seen nothing in my headlights as we blasted onto the bridge. It didn't matter. I wasn't going to stop. There were no amends to be made with this creepy fucked up town in the middle of nowhere. We weren't stopping for no one or nothing. Again, that was my plan, but like a general in the military will tell you, the best laid plans often go awry. I'll admit, we both looked behind us to see what might roll out from the undercarriage of the jeep as we continued, but nothing appeared. Danny cried out. Why are you slowing down? You didn't hit anything! Just go, damn it! Tears of fright filled her eyes as black streaks of mascara now lent proof that she had been through hell. I'm not slowing down because I want to, Danny. The damn jeep has a mind of its own. There was no fuel. I don't know how I was running to begin with. The momentum kept us rolling until we were close to seven or eight yards from the other side of the bridge, a little less than midway. The side of the bridge the mother who had just thrown her baby into the river had disappeared from. I turned to Danny, no longer able to keep my look of hope painted across my face. I fucking give up. You asked if you were going to die tonight. I looked away and my head dropped in shame. I'd given this my best shot and I was beat. I thought this trip was bullshit from the start. I hated ghost hunting as much as I despised those stupid fucking geocaching and Pokemon Go nerds. I knew why I'd given in. It wasn't because I gave a shit about local lore and haunted legends. I now knew it was possibly not even because I loved Danny. It all boiled down to sex. I knew she'd get all excited and tense, and then at the end of the evening we'd go back to our motel room and she would ride me like the fucking rodeo bronco I thought I was. I wanted to be her boy toy, not her satanic seeking sidekick. My only disappointment now is being stuck here on a haunted bridge on the outer edge of Helltown. And unless I could convince her that this was our last chance to make up love here in my Jeep with the busted out window, I wouldn't be getting laid that one last time before I died. Priorities, right? I thought to myself as I lifted my head back up and smirked. <laughs> Finish your sentence, Blake. What? I asked. You were saying about how you told me earlier when I asked about dying tonight. You quit talking for what seemed like an hour, and then guffawed just now. I was thinking, you know, just in case we don't make it, you wanna... The thought must have been smeared across my face, John to his horror. Was it that obvious? Blake, tell me you're not suggesting sex. Are you serious? Is that all I am to you? Is that why you were just gonna leave me here with your damn gun while you walked away? When she said it like that, I felt like a jerk. But not only had I agreed to take her on this ridiculous adventure, but I had also done everything in my power to keep her safe through this insanity. Now look at us. I'm struggling with the reality that we might not survive the night. But somehow, I'm the bad guy for wanting to go out with a bang. You're an asshole, Danny said. My mom was right. I should have never said yes so damn fast. I wanted to respond. I knew part of her nailed me right on top of my head, like a ten-penny nail. I sat silently trying to survey the lay of the land as much as I could see on a moonless night. I shook my head to myself again. Legends were rarely real. This was crazy. Surely we would both wake up in our bed realize it was all a weird bad dream, and then go straight for the skin game. I'm watching the looks on your face, Blake. You can sit there in silence, but you can be read like a cheap erotica novel. Danny shook her head and sneered. <sighs> I should have seen it sooner. I can leave if you'd like, was the only pitiful response I could muster. Nothing like sitting in the middle of a haunted-ass bridge in a haunted-ass town wondering when some frickin' mutant zombie or a python or devil worshipper is gonna kill us. Danny drew a large, shaky breath before continuing. 
and we're sitting in your Jeep like we're parked in my driveway back home. The focal point of everything evil could be outside surrounding us. And we're having our first major fight together about shagging or not. <laughs> Priceless. I laughed and smiled at Danny. <laughs> you got that right. I'm sorry. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving you here alone either. We're not gonna die. And when this is over, hopefully we can find some humor along with forgiveness from each other. I agree that I haven't handled this unusual pressure very well. There was a brief silence between us. I still love you, Danny. I hope so. Danny looked into my eyes. Her upper lip slightly quivered. I'd hate to think I wasted such an adventure on someone unworthy. We both smiled and she moved her hand to mine, which was still grasping the gear shift. My head lifted and my eyes searched to find hers in the darkened cab of the vehicle. Can I ask one favor from you, since it seems we're bearing the hatchet and making up? I moved my hand over to her shoulder, my fingers lightly caressing the base of her neck. I mean, this is the nicest way. Can I pick the next vacation destination? Maybe a Florida beach or Cancun? She slugged me on my arm and I felt the vehicle move slightly. Shush! I instantly cautioned, holding my finger up to my mouth. There was a soft sound, like sandpaper quietly being pulled across a rough piece of wood. We both froze in silence, our eyes intermittently moving from each other to the windows that enclosed us. I could instantly smell something that stunk. It smelled musky and decayed. I turned to Danny and asked, Do you smell... BAM! <coughs> Danny instantly screamed hysterically in the shrillest ear-piercing shriek. Chapter 8 Suddenly Alone The python's head quickly penetrated the opening of the jeep's door where the window glass once resided. Blake's face was 180 degrees opposite of the opening, staring at Danny. They had just come to terms and made up, making light humor about their situation, both feeling as if the worst was quite possibly over. Just six or seven hours from daylight to go. They had sat in the nearly sealed compartment of the Jeep, which was parked just past midway across the river atop Crybaby Bridge. It had taken breaking out the driver's side window to get this far before the engine sputtered once again to a dead roll. A cool breeze was blowing into the cab through Blake's open window. Danny's eyes had clearly shown she knew a makeup kiss was just seconds away from sealing their truce. Blake's tongue was just beginning to wetten with anticipation. She had also surely heard the strange, scratchy noise and felt the jeep jar back and forth slightly. It had drawn her view to the open window and Blake's last living sight of her eyes. That's when the dark shadow had become an instant nightmare. A snake's head, its mouth wide open when it struck the back of Blake's head with a jolt, piercing his skin and gripping his skull within its sharp teeth like a vice. Blake barely had enough time to open his eyes wider. The back of his head now clamped tightly in the grip of the gigantic snake's jaws. The python's sheer weight pulled Blake slowly backwards toward the open window head first. His hands flailed, grabbing at the ceiling and doorframe as the monstrous reptile pulled his bloodied body backwards out through the window. The huge, slithery serpent instantly began wrapping its thick, scaled body around Blake, constricting him tightly as he was finally pulled entirely through. <laughs> Danny shook as she screamed out. Her first thought was to run, but she quickly remembered what she had seen back behind her at the church and before her on the bridge. She was still trapped, but now even worse, Blake was surely gone for good. Were there more snakes outside? She saw Blake's shoe slowly fall back into the car as the last part of his body, his foot, slid out and down the side of the vehicle's door. She saw the gun lying on the dash and quickly grabbed it. Danny instinctively used the palm of her hand to pull the slide towards the rear of the weapon and quickly release it, charging the chamber with a round. Putting her trigger finger just outside the trigger guard until ready to fire, she carefully crawled across the driver's seat to peer out the open window. The snake's huge, thick body had already tightly looped around Blake's body several times and was squeezing him tightly, its jaws disengaged and fully engulfing Blake's head. There was no target to shoot without hitting Blake. 
He was already gone. Nothing but the sounds of bones crushing under pressure and body fluids being squeezed through compressed organs in subtle gurgles. The sight and sounds of what she was witnessing made her wretch. <coughs> She leaned toward the steering wheel and gagged, choking and spitting as her stomach tightened and cramped before spewing bile onto the dashboard and floor. She knew she had to leave the illusion of safety she felt in Blake's Jeep. Wiping her mouth and spitting what was left, she scooted back to the side farthest away from the open window. She had to think this through, quickly but thoroughly. Moving outside without a plan would be certain death. She was too smart for that. She looked down at her watch. 12 a.m., roughly six hours before daylight. She looked ahead through the windshield. Forward was the only route to take. She knew what lay behind her, and the distance from the bridge's rail to the river would bring broken bones or drowning for sure if she jumped. Yes, forward was the only way. I think. She spoke in a whisper to herself. How far until there was help? Think. I would come from the direction that I needed to head. She thought to herself. A gas station or farmhouse. What had she seen last before crossing the bridge on their way to Helltown? Another cool light breeze gusted through Blake's window. It stole her thoughts of what she had seen as far as human populated places. Danny looked back to the windshield where she saw the light fog of dust blowing again, this time over the hood of the Jeep. Oh shit, would the footprints be back? She thought. Sure enough, the first footprint appeared on the hood and began its toddler's dance across the front as the wet prints climbed the thin surface of the windshield. Danny soon heard the pitter-pat of tiny footsteps on the hood above her, along with coos and squeals. The muzzle of the handgun rose instinctively toward the roof as her finger entered the trigger guard. Could I really shoot through the roof into the sounds and footsteps of a cooing toddler? I mean, even though I know it's no longer a living human being... Danny had never been plagued with such a moral dilemma in her life as her internal thoughts battled for an answer. Her hand began to shake. She knew she could accidentally pull the trigger in such a state, so she slowly drew her finger back out away from the trigger and rested it against the slide. No. She answered her internal question out loud. The sounds continued as she reached over and flipped the headlight switch on, shining a bright path forward across the bridge's asphalt floor and past into the darkness several hundred feet ahead. A shudder from everything inside her brain caused her to gasp and struggle to draw a much-needed deep lung-filled breath. As she slowly exhaled, she whispered, Come. You can do this, Danny. You're a survivor. She crawled back to Blake's window and carefully leaned out to look. The predator and its prey, her fiancé, were gone from sight but she could still hear squishing, frothing noises from behind towards the rear of the vehicle. After maneuvering back to her side, she turned to look behind one last time. The silence within the jeep did not remain for very long. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Danny said aloud, as if still talking to Blake. She saw at least a dozen dark images several hundred feet in the distance. They appeared to be moving slowly, and they were carrying torches that danced back and forth. The flames were subtle, but shined enough to light the dark figures below them. Fucking mutant zombies! Danny checked her waistband for her second handgun and lifted Blake's backpack containing everything else the two of them had between them. She rolled her window down slowly and carefully peeked outside, looking down and above, the steps on the roof still producing light thumps back and forth overhead, swinging the door open. No real plan, but time to go. She said aloud as she cautiously put her foot on the ground and began swiftly moving across the bridge, her eyes roving from every angle, front to back and both sides, handgun charged and held in the defensive stance Blake had taught her. She looked behind her, and yes, the footprints were still following. She felt no threat from them now. She was glad she hadn't unloaded a magazine of 45 ACP hollow points into the roof of the jeep. She didn't understand the mother tossing her baby, nor did she grasp the wet footprints running willy-nilly through the dust. She did, however, for a moment, believe neither had meant any harm to her or Blake. She now wished they would have both kept moving forward instead of back to the vehicle. He'd still be alive and with her if they had. 
there were only three more extended steps to where the bridge met the pavement. Danny glanced over her shoulder to check the distance between her and the shimmering. Danny smiled to herself, feeling proud momentarily of her achievement and ability to keep her composure. I may be a girl, but I'm a force to be reckoned with. She thought to herself. Keep it up, girl. You're gonna make it. I don't know how you'll explain this shit, but you will survive. Were the words she spoke with excitement that gave her the veracity to continue on strong. Chapter 9 Reflections on the Move As soon as her foot crossed the seam between the bridge and the side of the road Danny stood on, she felt as if a badge of courage had been pinned on her chest. She had done it. She had not only survived, but done it on her own, of her own accord and wits. She slowed to a quick-paced walk, checking over her shoulder regularly to see if the flickering flames had gained any. Her fear was subsiding, and her survival instincts and nerve were welling up from her soul. She kept Blake's gun in hand, pointed it ahead, tracking along with wherever she turned. It had been quiet with no new threats or surprises for several minutes, maybe even longer than she presumed. Her mind still raced with all the events and the fact that she was still in the middle of a dark unknown, in the center of nowhere. Danny reflected on the fact she had just lost a man she had thought she had fallen in love with, albeit in a very short time. They had only known each other for less than six months. After her first major event with him, she had now questioned her judgment along with who he really was after the first sign of danger. He had brought out the worst in her. Self-doubt, fear, helplessness had awakened a serious question. But he then began to draw her back into his good side, causing her to see the things that had attracted her to him in the beginning. He had shown so much promise at first, and then, bam! The choice to continue or insert their relationship into the proverbial hangman's noose was instantly stolen from her, swallowed up by a creature so unbelievable that she herself doubted its authenticity. One large shiver pulsed down her spine as her body twitched and shuddered at the recollection of the horrible scene that took place before her eyes. He was practically jerked from her hands just moments before they were going to kiss. Her body quivered again, and she suddenly felt naked without a flashlight. She felt watched, stalked like a prey caught in the sight of something dark and hungry, slithering through the grass and twigs just outside of the illumination of her light's beam. The stars were shining from a clear sky, but not enough to emblazon the shadowy landscape on either side of the road she now traveled. Pulling Blake's bag from her shoulder, she unzipped it, reaching inside for Blake's flashlight. She felt a couple of magazines for the handgun and pulled them out. Yes, fully stacked. She stuck them in her front pocket, easily accessible if needed. She turned the mag light on after replacing the bag back over her shoulder. Glock Slim G36 in her waistband, Glock G21 in her other hand, tracking the beam of light with the barrel, like the television cops do, like Blake had shown her. She always knew he was heavily driven by sex, but he did share most of the things she loved also, and she thoroughly enjoyed making love to him. It hurt to know he really hadn't wanted to take this trip. He had known how she wanted to start doing dark tours of ghostly sights since they had met. She had been with friends discussing them at the local bar when he popped over to say hello to a mutual acquaintance. Sites like Helltown were scattered all over the country. The internet was overloaded with different towns and states with secret little hellholes of legend and lore. Even Blake's friends sounded knowledgeable of some. The Joplin spook light was the culprit that ensnared Danny's interest at an early age. She had only been 16 when she snuck away with friends in the middle of the night to travel 60-some miles to witness the odd glowing orb bounce around the old empty farm road close to the Missouri-Oklahoma border. The moment it appeared from out of nowhere, it grabbed and held her attention. She couldn't believe such things really existed in this world. There certainly must be an alternate universe that connected with ours at special places across the planet places where the spirit world and this tangible world shared the same space. At the spook light site, the magical, unexplainable, brightly lit ball of color danced its way from the distance until it was inches before her eyes, the odd feeling it gave her as it passed through her body in seconds and then disappeared. Didn't scare her, but instead empowered her. 
She had never witnessed anything like it before, and when she turned, the orb was there again in front. Her friends had screamed, Run! as they all scurried back towards the car. She stood entranced by the experience. The oddity of it all, from that point on, was inside her soul. She had always wanted more. The others called her crazy when she came back to the car, but they wanted to hear her story. What did she feel? Did she feel like she was magic or made foreign from the alien? Tonight, her first feeling was that she had gotten more than she had bargained for. When Blake was snagged away in such an unimaginable and horrific way, it scared the shit out of her. But it also woke up the orb inside her heart. Memories can bring weakness or conjure internal strength. Tonight, she chose strength. She would live. She had taken action to see to it. She also wouldn't give up on adventure. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, makes you hunger for more. She kept a steady pace down the eerie lonesome road. Danny kept her roving light beam changing the unknown darkness into brightly lit objects with deep shadows behind as her courage grew in strength. Her fear became intrigue. The unknown was morphing into the desire to conquer. She wouldn't be found cowering in a tree or crying for help under a porch any longer. Never again would she hide in those shadows that she would no longer retreat to. I am strength. I alone am a survivor of all. I'll not surrender until the last drop of my blood is spilled on the soil below me, and then I'll empty my weapon as I fall to my knees. These were the internal thoughts that battled and defeated the ones that would have her crumble helplessly and concede to cowardice. Chapter 10 Reborn Danny's New Perspective They say when one's spirit is reborn, a sharp burning sensation is felt deep within. Well, one can only imagine the inferno raging inside Danny's heart and soul at this moment. Her mind had been bombarded from every direction, from the thrill of adventure to the horror of watching the man she loved disappear before her eyes. He had been stolen from her in the most violent of ways. She ran the gamut of emotion, and everything in between had either tickled or stabbed at her psyche in the last several hours. Betrayal, fear, question, love, death. Danny's insides were too deeply scarred to ever allow her to forget tonight. Her inner mind was battling her beliefs and self-worth. Her consciousness had either ignored or was simply oblivious to these thoughts before. She was far too tortured and controlled by what she had witnessed and experienced to fully comprehend what was happening. Danny struggled to think clearly, but she suddenly felt that whatever that spook light was she had witnessed nine years ago had always laid dormant, nestled deep into hibernation within her being. But now... Now it had been awoken, possibly by the ravenous fear she had absorbed tonight. She felt like this unknown life force, if that was what it was, now gave her the power to take control of her previously unrevealed destiny. Her future would no longer be lost to chance by the toss of the dice. She was not only in control over that voracious fear within, but she had taken total control of it. She was now fully alive and transformed into a new being of sorts like a superhero. She had somehow leveled up in the game of life. I am reborn. I feel the power and strength of a hundred seasoned warriors have been awoken inside of me. She said to herself, her words were spoken aloud as if to internally bang the drums of victory with the thunder she felt. She was anything but drunk with the placebo of courage. Instead, she became the entire meaning of the word courage. Danny now knew she could face any battle without retreat. Her heart pounded harder at the mere thought, pumping faster, as if it was what drove the raging grandeur now searing through her veins. Danny turned to take notice of the position the flickering lights held. Had the zombies been foolish enough to follow her still? Yes, they were still trailing. She drew a breath and placed her hand holding the mag light close to her chest. Nestled next to her heart, its beam brightened. It was a sign from God. No one would ever believe her story, and she felt a searing heat like Joan of Arc must have endured at the stake. 
This would be a tale to carry silently within. Any slip of the tongue about tonight, and the world beyond would sedate her with Thorazine and lock her away in a padded room for fear she was too dangerous to herself or to them. She pointed the light beam in the direction she had turned, facing her pursuers. Danny felt a pop within her chest, much like the sound produced when the release of pressure from removing the lid off a jar containing preserved fruit. What followed was unexplainable. That orb from so many years ago popped from her chest and began dancing down the darkened road, much like the old farm road it had first appeared on. Its core spun in beautiful endless circles of twisted beams of colored light. The sphere moved like a beacon in front of her, guiding the path toward the battle she would now meet head on. Danny's heart pumped harder, deeper, and more rhythmic than she had ever noticed before. Her chest pounded with every bounce of that orb as it danced before her eyes, and in an instant she knew what it was communicating to her. Kill your fears tonight. Slay the mutant zombies with vengeance. Danny spoke the words aloud as if responding in unison to a collective voice of an army. An overwhelming smile spread across her face, reaching her eyes. She knew what she was destined to do. Danny then spoke five simple words before she began marching forward, following the lead of the shining globe toward the enemy and the field where combat was about to take place. <sighs> this is for us, Blake. Chapter 11 The Final Conflict The line of black silhouettes toting their lit torches of taunting flames began to close in. As Danny and the enemy drew near to one another, their line began to tighten. Outer black mutant combatants began moving closer to the center as if they knew they were preparing to battle an army of only one. She tried to count the dark shadows and concluded there were at least 20, maybe more. The night was still too dark to be certain, even though the sun was on the cusp of showing its face. It seemed as if the Earth's ball of light wanted to rise early enough to witness the event about to take place. The backpack on her shoulder dropped to the ground as she stood close enough to see the red gleam in their eyes. When the beam of light crossed the first target's shiny slits, she noticed it reacted as if it had burned, but its pain became instantly nullified when she fired her first aggressive round into its head. The 45 caliber ACP round caused a small explosion of reddish mist filling the air around it. The unfortunate recipient became the first casualty of war and tumbled forward into the dark shadowy ground. No reason not to throw the first proverbial punch, Danny thought, as she squeezed a second round which traveled quickly and penetrated the head of the shadow next to the first fallen dark fucker. Another explosion of zombie brain matter erupted from the side of its face before it too toppled to the ground, tripping the next one. <laughs> Loud cracks were followed by more liquid blowouts as bodies fell to the now blood-soaked ground. Danny began to methodically move the muzzle of her weapon down the line striking one after the other in its head and onto the next, like shooting ducks lined up in a pond, working back and forth from left to right and then reversing. It was as if she couldn't miss, each round finding its target and popping skulls like dime store balloons, splattering bright red crimson confetti, raining down its wetness all around her. The closer she came to the enemy, the stronger the stench of toxic rot became, quickly overtaking the air. The cloud hovering overhead caused Danny's eyes to sting, but she remained vigilant to inner assault, never ceasing a second from pulling the trigger. The black faceless goons continued to fall against each other, spilling their bloody goo before stumbling clumsily to the ground. She hadn't counted her shots, but instinctively dropped the mag light, now close enough to see without it, spontaneously drawing another magazine of rounds from her pocket. Before the handgun clicked empty and the receiver hung open, she ejected the nearly spent magazine, leaving one in the chamber, and quickly inserted the next, never missing the rhythm of a missed round and another dropped mutant. The orb continued to bounce across the battlefield as if it were directing the scene like a band leader would conduct his orchestra, enjoying every deadly kill as if it were a spectacular note hit in perfection. As she turned to continue playing her instrument, the odor became stronger of spent powder and rotting death giving the incentive to finish the masterpiece even quicker. She upped the speed of the tempo's aggression, killing zombies at even a faster rate, driving the finish of the concert toward a quickened end with gusto. 
<laughs> In one stroke of motion, she again reloaded as fluidly as a violinist draws a sweet note with their horsehair bow being pulled across the strings. The scene was horrific and beautiful at the same time. Danny knew Blake and her father would be proud of her performance, somehow wishing they were both in heaven's balcony, watching her virtuoso from box seats. The time went by in slow motion to her, but the finale ended as the last round in the Glock left its barrel and entered the final aggressor's head, sending him bobbling to the ground in a drum roll. The Glock's slide now hanging open in her hand as she readied herself to take a bow. As if called back for an encore, a head slowly lifted from the battlefield and Danny walked over, reaching for the second weapon from her waist and lowering its muzzle to the enemy's dark, moist face. The sound of a quick double tap ended the show with a spray of black splatter reddening Danny's soiled white tank top. A single bead of sweat rolled down to the tip of Danny's nose before plunging off in a swan dive and onto the smoldering battlefield to a sizzle. It was done. Her concerto was complete. She stood and surveyed the grounds with pride and swore there was a light applause from two spectators from up above. <laughs> the sun peeked out with a slight hint of its light as Danny continued down the lone road toward home. She didn't know where or how long her walk would take her as the morning began to quietly whisper its entrance. She noticed a faded black iron entryway and gate up ahead with various sized headstones in mixed subtle colors rising from the ground below. It was the cemetery. She and Blake had somehow driven past it without taking notice as they had hurried, filled with the excitement of arriving at Helltown early last evening. A lot had happened since then. A lifetime in a mere single night. Walking past the gate, Danny glanced over and sure enough, there was the old man apparition wandering around the cemetery as legend was written. Walking with no apparent cause, barely visible in its hazy silhouette. It wasn't fear that drew her hand to the butt of the gun tucked back neatly in her waistband behind her. She had conquered that old adversary. It was a new instinct, memory muscle, a habit she wasn't even aware she had obtained. Danny watched the old ghost moving around with inconsistency as if he were looking for something he had lost, maybe a spouse or good friend. That's when she noticed her orb bouncing around within the stone monument. Had it found its home too? She stopped for a moment, and as the sun crested the horizon, bringing light and color to the world once again, she instantly heard the now familiar pop sound. As the orb touched the apparition while it was almost seated on a bench, they both vanished at once, just before a single beam of the sun's light could bridge a connection with them. In that nanosecond of an instant, Danny knew her dark adventure had drawn to a close. A feeling of complete calm fell over her, and an extreme sense of accomplishment brought any sense of fear and snuffed it out like wind to the candle's flame. Whoosh. The sound of a motor hummed in the distance, and Danny stood near the cemetery's entrance as a vehicle of some sort made its way over several slight inclines, peeking its head over the top briefly as it broached the peak and then disappearing again as it recessed into a valley until the next hill blurred from afar but gaining clarity as it came closer. The small bus finally crested the last rise in the road but then slowed to a snail's pace as it cautiously drove past. Five or six sets of eyes filled with inquisitive but hesitant apprehension peered through the slightly tinted windows. As the passenger van eased on by, Danny couldn't believe what she saw emblazoned on its white side panel as it passed. The words did, however, bring another huge smile to her face as she read them, feeling a small sense of connection to her fiancé. If you're ever Helltown bound, come ride in air-conditioned comfort and ghoulish style. Brought to you by Blake Evans Dark Tourism Adventure Bus Incorporated. You'll just die if you miss it. 740 Snakes Suck S-N-A-X-S-U-K 7629785 Day had broken cold and gray, exceedingly cold and gray, when the man turned aside from the main Yukon Trail and climbed the high earth bank, where a dim and little traveled trail led eastward to the fat spruce timberland. It was a steep bank 
and he paused for breath at the top, excusing the act to himself by looking at his watch. It was nine o'clock. There was no sun, nor hint of sun, though there was not a cloud in the sky. It was a clear day, and yet there seemed an intangible pall over the face of things, a subtle gloom that made the day dark, and that was due to the absence of sun. This fact did not worry the man. He was used to the lack of sun. It had been days since he had seen the sun, and he knew that a few more days must pass before that cheerful orb due south would just peep above the skyline and dip immediately from view. The man flung a look back along the way he had come. The Yukon lay a mile wide and hidden under three feet of ice. On top of this ice were as many feet of snow. It was all pure white, rolling in gentle undulations where the ice jams of the freeze-up had formed. North and south, as far as his eye could see, it was unbroken white, save for a dark hairline that curved and twisted from around the spruce-covered island to the south, and that curved and twisted away into the north, where it disappeared behind another spruce-covered island. This dark hairline was the trail, the main trail, that led south 500 miles to the Chilkoot Pass, Dai and salt water, and that led north 70 miles to Dawson, and still on to the north a thousand miles to Nulato, and finally to St. Michael on Bering Sea, a thousand miles, and half a thousand more. But all this, the mysterious far-reaching hairline trail, the absence of sun from the sky, the tremendous cold, and the strangeness and weirdness of it all, made no impression on the man. It was not because he was long used to it. He was a newcomer in this land, and this was his first winter. The trouble with him was that he was without imagination. He was quick and alert in the things of life, but only in the things and not in the significances. Fifty degrees below zero meant eighty-odd degrees of frost. Such facts impressed him as being cold and uncomfortable but that was all. It did not lead him to meditate upon his frailty as a creature of temperature and upon man's frailty in general, able only to live within certain narrow limits of heat and cold, and from there on it did not lead him to the conjectural field of immortality and man's place in the universe. Fifty degrees below zero stood for the bite of frost that hurt and that must be guarded against by the use of mittens ear flaps, warm moccasins, and thick socks. Fifty degrees below zero was to him just precisely fifty degrees below zero. That there should be anything more to it than that was a thought that had never entered his head. As he turned to go on, he spat speculatively. There was a sharp, explosive crackle that startled him. He spat again, and again in the air before it could fall to the snow. The spittle crackled. He knew that at fifty below, spittle crackled in the snow, but this spittle had crackled in the air. Undoubtedly, it was colder than fifty below. How much colder? He did not know. But the temperature did not matter. He was bound for the old claim on the left fork of Henderson Creek, where the boys were already. They had come across the divide from the Indian Creek country. Well, he had come to the roundabout way to take a look at the possibilities of getting out logs in the spring from the islands in the Yukon. He would be into camp by six o'clock. A bit after dark, it was true. But the boys would be there. A fire would be going. And a hot supper would be ready. As for lunch, he pressed his hand against the protruding bundle under his jacket. It was also under his shirt wrapped up in a handkerchief and lying against the naked skin. It was the only way to keep the biscuits from freezing. He smiled agreeably to himself as he thought of those biscuits, each cut open and sopped in bacon grease, and each enclosing a generous slice of fried bacon. He plunged in among the big spruce trees. The trail was faint. A foot of snow had fallen since the last sled had passed over, and he was glad he was without a sled, traveling light. In fact, 
He carried nothing but the lunch wrapped in the handkerchief. He was surprised, however, at the cold. It certainly was cold, he concluded as he rubbed his numb nose and cheekbones with his mittened hand. He was a warm, whiskered man, but the hair on his face did not protect the high cheekbones and the eager nose that thrust itself aggressively into the frosty air. At the man's heel trotted a dog, a big native husky, the proper wolf dog, gray-coated and without any visible or temperamental differences from its brother, the wild wolf. The animal was depressed by the tremendous cold. It knew that it was no time for traveling. Its instinct told it a truer tale that was told to the man by the man's judgment. In reality, it was not merely colder than fifty below zero. It was colder than sixty below, than seventy below. It was seventy-five below zero. Since the freezing point is thirty-two above zero, it meant that one hundred and seven degrees of frost obtained. The dog did not know anything about thermometers. Possibly in its brain there was no sharp consciousness of a condition of very cold such as was in the man's brain, but the brute had its instinct. It experienced a vague but menacing apprehension that subdued it and made it slink along at the man's heels, and that made it question eagerly every unwanted movement of the man, as if expecting him to go into camp or to seek shelter somewhere and build a fire. The dog had learned fire, and it wanted fire, or else to burrow under the snow and cuddle its warmth away from the air. The frozen moisture of its breathing had settled on its fur in a fine powder of frost, and especially where its jowls, muzzle, and eyelashes whitened by its crystalled breath. The man's red beard and mustache were likewise frosted, but more solidly, the deposit taking the form of ice and increasing with every warm, moist breath he exhaled. Also, the man was chewing tobacco, and the muzzle of ice held his lips so rigidly that he was unable to clear his chin when he expelled the juice. The result was that a crystal beard of the color and solidity of amber was increasing its length on his chin. If he fell down, it would shatter itself like glass into brittle fragments. But he did not mind the appendage. It was the penalty all tobacco chewers paid in that country, and he had been out before in two cold snaps. They had not been so cold as this, he knew, but by the spirit thermometer at sixty mile, he knew they had been registered at fifty below, and at fifty-five. He held on through the level stretch of woods for several miles, crossed a wide flat of rigger heads, and dropped down a bank to the frozen bed of a small stream. This was Henderson Creek, and he knew he was ten miles from the forks. He looked at his watch. It was ten o'clock. He was making four miles an hour, and he calculated that he would arrive at the forks at half past twelve. He decided to celebrate that event by eating his lunch there. The dog dropped in again at his heels with a tail drooping discouragement as the man swung along the creek bed. The furrow of the old sled trail was plainly visible, but a dozen inches of snow covered the marks of the last runners. In a month, no man had come up or down that silent creek. The man held steadily on. He was not much given to thinking, and just then, particularly, he had nothing to think about save that he would eat lunch at the Forks, and that at six o'clock he would be in camp with the boys. There was nobody to talk to, and... Had there been, speech would have been impossible because of the ice muzzle on his mouth. So, he continued monotonously to chew tobacco and to increase the length of his amber beard. Once in a while, the thought reiterated itself that it was very cold and that he had never experienced such cold. As he walked along, he rubbed his cheekbones and nose with the back of his mittened hand. He did this automatically, now and again changing hands. But, rub as he would, the instant he stopped his cheekbones went numb, and the following instant the end of his nose went numb. He was sure to frost his cheeks, he knew that, 
and experienced a pang of regret that he had not devised a nose strap of the sort Bud wore in cold snaps. Such a strap passed across the cheeks as well, and saved them. But it didn't matter much after all. What were frosted cheeks? A bit painful, that was all. They were never serious. Empty as the man's mind was of thoughts, he was keenly observant, and he noticed the changes in the creek, the curves and bends and timber jams, and always he sharply noted where he placed his feet. Once coming around a bend, he shied abruptly like a startled horse, curved away from the place where he had been walking, and retreated several paces back along the trail. The creek he knew was frozen clear to the bottom. No creek contained water in that arctic winter, but he knew also that there were springs that bubbled out from the hillsides and ran along under the snow and on top of the ice of the creek. He knew that the coldest snaps never froze these springs, and he knew likewise their danger. They were traps. They had pools of water under the snow that might be three inches deep, or three feet. Sometimes a skin of ice half an inch thick covered them, and in turn was covered by the snow. Sometimes there were alternate layers of ice and ice skin, so that when one broke through, he kept on breaking through for a while, sometimes wetting himself to the waist. That was why he had shied in such panic. He had felt the give under his feet and heard the crackle of a snow-hidden ice skin, and to get his feet wet in such a temperature meant trouble and danger. At the very least it meant delay, for he would be forced to stop and build a fire, and under its protection to bare his feet while he dried his socks and moccasins. He stood and studied the creek bed and its banks, and decided that the flow of water came from the right. He reflected a while, rubbing his nose and cheeks, then skirted to the left, stepping gingerly and testing the footing of each step. Once clear of the danger, he took a fresh chew of tobacco and swung along at his four-mile gait. In the course of the next two hours, he came upon several similar traps. Usually the snow above the hidden pools had a sunken, candied appearance that advertised the danger. Once again, however, he had a close call. And once, suspecting danger, he compelled the dog to go in front. The dog did not want to go. It hung back until the man shoved it forward, and then it went quickly across the white, unbroken surface. Suddenly, it broke through, floundered to one side, and got away to firmer footing. It had wet its forefeet and legs, and almost immediately the water that clung to it turned to ice. It made quick efforts to lick the ice off its legs, then dropped down in the snow and began to bite out the ice that had formed between the toes. This was a matter of instinct. To permit the ice to remain would mean sore feet. It did not know this. It merely obeyed the mysterious prompting that rose from the deep crypts of its being. But the man knew, having achieved a judgment on the subject, and he removed the mitten from his right hand and helped tear out the ice particles. He did not expose his fingers more than a minute, and was astonished at the swift numbness that smote them. It certainly was cold. He pulled on the mitten hastily and beat the hand savagely across his chest. At twelve o'clock, the day was at its brightest, yet the sun was too far south in its winter journey to clear the horizon. The bulge of the earth intervened between it and Henderson Creek, where the man walked under a clear sky at noon and cast no shadow. At half past twelve to the minute, he arrived at the forks of the creek. He was pleased at the speed he had made. If he kept it up, he would certainly be with the boys by six. He unbuttoned his jacket and shirt and drew forth his lunch. The action consumed no more than a quarter of a minute. Yet, in that brief moment, the numbness laid hold of his exposed fingers. He did not put the mittens on, but instead struck the fingers a dozen sharp smashes against his leg. Then... He sat down in a snow-covered log to eat. The sting that followed upon the striking of his fingers against his legs ceased so quickly that he was startled. He had had no chance to take a bite of biscuit. He struck the fingers repeatedly and returned them to the mitten, bearing the other hand for the purpose of eating. 
He tried to take a mouthful, but the ice muzzle prevented. He had forgotten to build a fire and thaw out. He chuckled at his foolishness, and as he chuckled he noted the numbness creeping into the exposed fingers. Also, he noted that the stinging which had first come to his toes when he sat down was already passing away. He wondered whether the toes were warm or numb. He moved them inside the moccasins and decided that they were numb. He pulled the mitten on hurriedly and stood up. He was a bit frightened. He stamped up and down until the stinging returned into the feet. It certainly was cold, was his thought. That man from Sulphur Creek had spoken the truth when telling how cold it sometimes got in the country, and he had laughed at him at the time. That showed one must not be too sure of things. There was no mistake about it. It was cold. He strode up and down, stamping his feet and threshing his arms until reassured by the returning warmth. Then, he got out matches and proceeded to make a fire. From the undergrowth where high water of the previous spring had lodged a supply of seasoned twigs, he got his firewood. Working carefully from a small beginning, he soon had a roaring fire, over which he thawed the ice from his face, and in the protection of which he ate his biscuits. For the moment, the cold of space was outwitted. The dog took satisfaction in the fire, stretching out close enough for warmth and far enough away to escape being singed. When the man had finished, he filled his pipe and took his comfortable time over a smoke. Then, he pulled on his mittens, settled the ear flaps of his cap firmly about his ears, and took the creek trail up the left fork. The dog was disappointed and yearned back toward the fire. This man did not know cold. Possibly all the generations of his ancestry had been ignorant of cold, of real cold, of cold 107 degrees below freezing point. But the dog knew. All its ancestry knew, and it had inherited the knowledge. And it knew that it was not good to walk abroad in such fearful cold. It was the time to lie snug in a hole in the snow and wait for a curtain of cloud to be drawn across the face of outer space whence this cold came. On the other hand, there was no keen intimacy between the dog and the man. The one was the toil slave of the other, and the only caresses it had ever received were the caresses of the whiplash, and of harsh and menacing throat sounds that threatened the whiplash. So, the dog made no effort to communicate its apprehension to the man. It was not concerned in the welfare of the man. It was for its own sake that it yearned back toward the fire. But the man whistled and spoke to it with the sound of whiplashes, and the dog swung in at the man's heel and followed after her. The man took a chew of tobacco and proceeded to start a new amber beard. Also, his moist breath quickly powdered with white his mustache, eyebrows, and lashes. There did not seem to be so many springs on the left fork of the Henderson, and for half an hour the man saw no signs of any. And then it happened. At a place where there were no signs, where the soft unbroken snow seemed to advertise solidity beneath, the man broke through. It was not deep. He wet himself halfway to the knees before he floundered out to the firm crust. He was angry, and cursed his luck aloud. He had hoped to get into camp with the boys at six o'clock, and this would delay him an hour, for he would have to build a fire and dry out his footgear. This was imperative at that low temperature, he knew that much, and he turned aside to the bank, which he climbed. On top, tangled in the underbrush about the trunks of several small spruce trees, was a high-water deposit of dry firewood. Sticks and twigs principally, but also larger portions of seasoned branches and fine, dry last year's grasses. They threw down several large pieces on top of the snow. This served for a foundation and prevented the young flame from drowning itself in the snow it otherwise would melt. The fire he got by touching a match to a small shred of birch bark that he took out of his pocket. 
This burned even more readily than paper. Placing it on the foundation, he fed the young flame with wisps of dry grass and with the tiniest dry twigs. He worked slowly and carefully, keenly aware of his danger. Gradually, as the flame grew stronger, he increased the size of the twigs with which he fed it. He squatted in the snow, pulling the twigs out from their entanglement in the brush and feeding directly to the flame. He knew there must be no failure. When it is seventy-five below zero, a man must not fail in his first attempt to build a fire. That is, if his feet are wet. If his feet are dry and he fails, he can run along the trail for half a mile and restore his circulation. But the circulation of wet and freezing feet cannot be restored by running when it is seventy-five below. No matter how fast he runs, the wet feet will freeze the harder. All this the man knew. The old-timer on Sulphur Creek had told him about it the previous fall, and now he was appreciating the advice. Already all sensation had gone out of his feet. To build the fire he had been forced to remove his mittens, and the fingers had quickly gone numb. His pace of four miles an hour had kept his heart pumping blood to the surface of his body and to all the extremities, but the instant he stopped, the action of the pump eased down. The cold of space smote the unprotected tip of the planet, and he, being on that unprotected tip, received the full force of the blow. The blood of his body recoiled before it. The blood was alive, like the dog, and like the dog it wanted to hide away and cover itself up from the fearful cold. So long as he walked four miles an hour, he pumped that blood, willy-nilly, to the surface. But now, it ebbed away and sank down into the recesses of his body. The extremities were the first to feel its absence. His wet feet froze the faster, and his exposed fingers numbed the faster, though they had not yet begun to freeze. Nose and cheeks were already freezing, while the skin of all his body chilled as it lost its blood. But he was safe. Toes and nose and cheeks would be only touched by the frost, for the fire was beginning to burn with strength. He was feeding it with twigs the size of his finger. In another minute, he would be able to feed it with branches the size of his wrist, and then he could remove his wet footgear, and while it dried, he could keep his naked feet warm by the fire, rubbing them at first, of course, with snow. The fire was a success. He was safe. He remembered the advice of the old-timer on Sulphur Creek and smiled. The old-timer had been very serious in laying down the law that no man must travel alone in the Klondike after fifty below. Well, here he was. He had had the accident. He was alone. And he had saved himself. Those old-timers were rather womanish, some of them, he thought. All a man had to do was to keep his head, and he was all right. Any man who was a man could travel alone. But it was surprising, the rapidity with which his cheeks and nose were freezing, and he had not thought his fingers could go lifeless in so short a time. Lifeless they were, for he could scarcely make them move together to grip a twig, and they seemed remote from his body and from him. When he touched a twig, he had to look and see whether or not he had hold of it. The wires were pretty well down between him and his finger ends all of which counted for little. There was the fire, snapping and crackling and promising life with every dancing flame. He started to untie his moccasins. They were coated with ice. The thick German socks were like sheaths of iron halfway to the knees, and the moccasin strings were like rods of steel, all twisted and knotted as by some conflagration. For a moment he tugged with his numb fingers. Then... Realizing the folly of it, he drew his sheath knife. But, before he could cut the strings, it happened. It was his own fault, or rather his mistake. He should not have built the fire under the spruce tree. He should have built it in the open. But it had been easier to pull the twigs from the brush and drop them directly on the fire. 
Now, the tree under which she had done this carried a weight of snow on its boughs. No wind had blown for weeks, and each bough was fully freighted. Each time he had pulled a twig, he had communicated a slight agitation to the tree, an imperceptible agitation, so far as he was concerned, but an agitation sufficient to bring about the disaster. High up in the tree, one bough capsized its load of snow. This fell on the boughs beneath, capsizing them. This process continued, spreading out and involving the whole tree. It grew like an avalanche, and it descended without warning upon the man and the fire. And the fire was blotted out. Where it had burned was a mantle of fresh and disordered snow. The man was shocked. It was as though he had just heard his own sentence of death. For a moment he sat and stared at the spot where the fire had been. Then he grew very calm. Perhaps the old timer on Sulphur Creek was right. If he had only had a trail mate, he would have been in no danger now. The trail mate could have built the fire. Well, it was up to him to build the fire over again. And this second time, there must be no failure. Even if he succeeded, he would most likely lose some toes. His feet must be badly frozen by now, and there would be some time before the second fire was ready. Such were his thoughts, but he did not sit and think them. He was busy all the time they were passing through his mind. He made a new foundation for a fire, this time in the open, where no treacherous tree could blot it out. Next, he gathered dry grasses and tiny twigs from the high water flotsam. He could not bring his fingers together to pull them out, but he was able to gather them by the handful. In this way, he got many rotten twigs and bits of green moss that were undesirable, but it was the best he could do. He worked methodically, even collecting an armful of the larger branches to be used later when the fire gathered strength. And all the while, the dog sat and watched him, a certain yearning wistfulness in its eyes, for it looked upon him as the fire provider, and the fire was slow in coming. When all was ready, the man reached in his pocket for a second piece of birch bark. He knew the bark was there, and, though he could not feel it with his fingers, he could hear its crisp rustling as he fumbled for it. Try as he would, he could not clutch hold of it, and all the time in his consciousness was the knowledge that each instant his feet were freezing. This thought tended to put him in a panic, but he fought against it and kept calm. He pulled on his mittens with his teeth and threshed his arms back and forth, beating his hands with all his might against his sides. He did this sitting down, and he stood up to do it, and all the while the dog sat in the snow, its wolf brush of a tail curled around warmly over its forefeet, its sharp wolf ears pricked forward intently as it watched the man. And the man, as he beat and threshed with his arms and hands, felt a great surge of envy as he regarded the creature that was warm and secure in its natural covering. After a time, he was aware of the first faraway signals and sensation in his beaten fingers. The faint tingling grew stronger till it evolved into a stinging ache that was excruciating, but which the man hailed with satisfaction. He stripped the mitten from his right hand and fetched forth the birch bark. The exposed fingers were quickly going numb again. Next, he brought out his bunch of sulfur matches, but the tremendous cold had already driven the life out of his fingers. In his effort to separate one match from the others, the whole bunch fell in the snow. They tried to pick it out of the snow, but failed. The dead fingers could neither touch nor clutch. He was very careful. He drove the thought of his freezing feet and nose and cheeks out of his mind devoting his whole soul to the matches. He watched, using the sense of vision in place of that of touch, and when he saw his fingers on each side the bunch, he closed them. That is, he willed them to close, for the wires were down, and the fingers did not obey. He pulled the mitten on the right hand and beat it furiously against his knee. Then, with both mittened hands, he scooped the bunch of matches 
along with much snow, into his lap. Yet, he was no better off. After some manipulation, he managed to get the bunch between the heels of his mittened hands. In this fashion, he carried it to his mouth. The ice crackled and snapped when, by a violent effort, he opened his mouth. He drew the lower jaw in, curled the upper lip out of the way, and scraped the bunch with his upper teeth in order to separate a match. He succeeded in getting one, which he dropped on his lap. He was no better off. He could not pick it up. Then, he devised a way. He picked it up in his teeth and scratched it on his leg. Twenty times he scratched before he succeeded in lighting it. As it flamed, he held it with his teeth to the birch bark, but the burning brimstone went up his nostrils and into his lungs, causing him to cough spasmodically. The match fell into the snow and went out. The old timer on Sulphur Creek was right, he thought, in the moment of controlled despair that ensued. After fifty below, a man should travel with a partner. He beat his hands but failed in exciting any sensation. Suddenly, he bared both hands, removing the mittens with his teeth. He caught the whole bunch between the heels of his hands. His arm muscles not being frozen enabled him to press the hand heels tightly against the matches. Then, he scratched the bunch along his leg. It flared into flame, seventy sulfur matches at once. There was no wind to blow them out. He kept his head to one side to escape the strangling fumes and held the blazing bunch to the birch bark. As he so held it, he became aware of sensation in his hand. His flesh was burning. He could smell it. Deep down below the surface, he could feel it. The sensation developed into pain that grew acute. And still, he endured, holding the flame of the matches clumsily to the bark that would not light readily because his own burning hands were in the way, absorbing most of the flame. At last, when he could endure no more, he jerked his hands apart. The blazing matches fell sizzling into the snow, but the birch bark was alight. He began laying dry grasses and the tiniest twigs on the flame. He could not pick and choose, for he had to lift the fuel between the heels of his hands. Small pieces of rotten wood and green moss clung to the twigs, and he bit them off as well he could with his teeth. He cherished the flame carefully and awkwardly. It meant life, and it must not perish. The withdrawal of blood from the surface of his body now made him begin to shiver, and he grew more awkward. A large piece of green moss fell squarely on the little fire. He tried to poke it out with his fingers, but his shivering frame made him poke too far, and he disrupted the nucleus of the little fire, the burning grasses and tiny twigs separating and scattering. He tried to poke them together again, but in spite of the tenseness of the effort, his shivering got away with him, and the twigs were hopelessly scattered. Each twig gushed a puff of smoke and went out. The fire provider had failed. As he looked apathetically about him, his eyes chanced on the dog, sitting across the ruins of the fire from him, in the snow, making restless, hunching movements, slightly lifting one forefoot and then the other shifting its weight back and forth on them with wistful eagerness. The sight of the dog put a wild idea into his head. He remembered the tale of the man, caught in a blizzard, who killed a steer and crawled inside the carcass, and so was saved. He would kill the dog and bury his hands in the warm body until the numbness went out of them. Then, he could build another fire. He spoke to the dog calling it to him, but in his voice was a strange note of fear that frightened the animal, who had never known the man to speak in such a way before. Something was the matter, and its suspicious nature sensed a danger. It knew not what danger, but somewhere, somehow, in its brain, arose an apprehension of the man. It flattened its ears down at the sound of the man's voice, and its restless, hunching movements and the lifting and shifting of its forefeet became more pronounced. 
but it would not come to the man. He got on his hands and knees and crawled toward the dog. This unusual posture again excited suspicion, and the animal sidled mincingly away. The man sat up in the snow for a moment and struggled for calmness. Then he pulled on his mittens by means of his teeth and got upon his feet. He glanced down at first in order to assure himself that he was really standing up, but the absence of sensation in his feet left him unrelated to the earth. His erect position in itself started to drive the webs of suspicion from the dog's mind, and when he spoke, with the sound of the whiplash in his voice, the dog rendered its customary allegiance and came to him. As it came within reaching distance, the man lost control. His arms flashed out to the dog and he experienced genuine surprise when he discovered that his hands could not clutch, that there was neither bend nor feeling in the fingers. He had forgotten for the moment that they were frozen and that they were freezing more and more. All this happened quickly and before the animal could get away he encircled its body with his arms. He sat down in the snow and in this fashion held the dog while it snarled and whined and struggled. But it was all he could do, hold its body encircled in his arms and sit there. He realized that he could not kill the dog. There was no way to do it. With his helpless hands he could neither draw nor hold his sheath knife or throttle the animal. He released it and it plunged wildly away with tail between its legs and still snarling. It halted forty feet away and surveyed him curiously, with ears sharply pricked forward. The man looked down at his hands in order to locate them, and found them hanging on the ends of his arms. It struck him as curious that one should have to use his eyes in order to find out where his hands were. He began threshing his arms back and forth, beating the mittened hands against his sides. He did this for five minutes, violently and his heart pumped enough blood up to the surface to put a stop to his shivering, but no sensation was aroused in the hands. He had an impression that they hung like weights on the ends of his arms, but when he tried to run the impression down, he could not find it. A certain fear of death, dull and oppressive, came to him. This fear quickly became poignant as he realized that it was no longer a mere matter of freezing his fingers and toes or of losing his hands and feet, but that it was a matter of life and death, with the chances against him. This threw him into a panic and he turned and ran up the creek bed along the old dim trail. The dog joined in behind and kept up with him. He ran blindly without intention, in fear as such as he had never known in his life. Slowly, as he plowed and floundered through the snow, he began to see things again. The banks of the creek, the old timber jams, the leafless aspens, and the sky. The running made him feel better. He did not shiver. Maybe, if he ran on, his feet would thaw out. And, anyway, if he ran far enough he would reach camp and the boys. Without doubt he would lose some fingers and toes and some of his face, but the boys would take care of him and save the rest of him when he got there. And at the same time there was another thought in his mind that said he would never get to the camp and the boys, that it was too many miles away, that the freezing had too great a start on him, and that he would soon be stiff and dead. This thought he kept in the background and refused to consider. Sometimes it pushed itself forward and demanded to be heard, but he thrust it back and strove to think of other things. It struck him as curious that he could run at all on feet so frozen that he could not feel them when they struck the earth and took the weight of his body. He seemed to himself to skim along above the surface and have no connection with the earth. Somewhere he had once seen a winged Mercury, and he wondered if Mercury felt as he felt when skimming over the earth. His theory of running until he reached camp and the boys had one flaw in it. He lacked the endurance. Several times he stumbled and finally he tottered, crumpled up, and fell. When he tried to rise he failed. He must sit and rest, he decided. 
and next time he would merely walk and keep on going. As he sat and regained his breath, he noted that he was feeling quite warm and comfortable. He was not shivering, and it even seemed that a warm glow had come to his chest and trunk. And yet, when he touched his nose or cheeks, there was no sensation. Running would not thaw them out, nor would it thaw out his hands and feet. Then the thought came to him that the frozen portions of his body must be extending. He tried to keep this thought down, to forget it, to think of something else. He was aware of the panicky feeling that it caused, and he was afraid of the panic. But the thought asserted itself, and persisted, until it produced a vision of his body totally frozen. This was too much, and he made another wild run along the trail. Once he slowed down to a walk, but the thought of the freezing extending itself made him run again, and all the time the dog ran with him at his heels. When he fell down a second time, it curled its tail over its forefeet and sat in front of him, facing him, curiously eager and intent. The warmth and security of the animal angered him, and he cursed it till it flattened down its ears appealingly. This time, the shivering came more quickly upon the man. He was losing in his battle with the frost. It was creeping into his body from all sides. The thought of it drove him on, but he ran no more than a hundred feet when he staggered and pitched headlong. It was his last panic. When he had recovered his breath and control, he sat up and entertained in his mind the conception of meeting death with dignity. However, the conception did not come to him in such terms. His idea of it was that he had been making a fool of himself, running around like a chicken with its head cut off. Such was the simile that occurred to him. Well, he was bound to freeze anyway, and he might as well take it decently. With this newfound peace of mind came the first glimmerings of drowsiness. A good idea, he thought, to sleep off to death. It was like taking an anesthetic. Freezing was not so bad as people thought. There were lots worse ways to die. He pictured the boys finding his body the next day. Suddenly, he found himself with them, coming along the trail and looking for himself. And, still with them, he came around a turn in the trail and found himself lying in the snow. He did not belong with himself anymore, for even he was out of himself, standing with the boys and looking at himself in the snow. It certainly was cold, was his thought. When he got back to the States, he could tell the folks what real cold was. He drifted on from this to a vision of the old-timer on Sulphur Creek. He could see him quite clearly, warm and comfortable and smoking a pipe. You were right, old hoss. You were right, the man mumbled to the old-timer of Sulphur Creek. Then, the man drowsed off into what seemed to him the most comfortable and satisfying sleep he had ever known. The dog sat facing him and waiting. The brief day drew to a close in a long, slow twilight. There were no signs of a fire to be made, and, besides... Never in the dog's experience had it known a man to sit like that in the snow and make no fire. As the twilight drew on, its eager yearning for the fire mastered it, and, with a great lifting and shifting of forefeet, it whined softly, then flattened its ears down in anticipation of being chided by the man. But the man remained silent. Later, the dog whined loudly, and still later, it crept close to the man and caught the scent of death. This made the animal bristle and back away. A little longer it delayed, howling under the stars that leapt and danced and shone brightly in the cold sky. Then, it turned.
Chilling Tales for Dark.